Okay, so it is now half eight. So let's see if the audio is working here. Yep, that seems to be fine. So we will switch to this and we should be mostly ready to go. Okay, there we go. Yes. Okay, so um, basically I have two documents here. One just has some of the information on the news. The other has a lot of notes, kind of quite detailed notes about uh, the dawn of Yang Chen. I won't even switch over to them now because there might be spoilers uh, that, you know, people might not want to see right at the start. So yeah, uh, like I said, we'll go news first, then spoilers. So we'll start off with the, the news that happened uh, first, which was a surprising Avatar Studios news. Um, from the convention. Now, we didn't go in expecting anything, um, and in many ways, if you watch the, the little Janet Varney video, um, it really came across as if the only reason they even gave this out was because, in a way, there's been runaway rumors and uh, <laughs> insider information. Um, the clear and obvious reference to these rumors, um, the fact that Janet Varney was holding the Kiyoshi novel while she made it, um, all seems uh, very, like, on the nose. But, of course, the main announcement was that the movie will focus on Avatar Aang and Friends. So, very obvious. Made sense. Um, I don't think it's really that much of a surprise. I, I think a lot of people... I've seen a few posts on like Twitter about people being very disappointed that we've switched from, you know, doing the Kyoshi movie first, as was sort of rumored, to doing the, you know, really obvious ATLA one. Um, and I get that to a certain degree, but this was what was needed to do. Um, uh, just because it has been so long uh, in terms of like, Waiting to finally get the ATLA crew when they're older has been something we've been waiting for for years. Like it says a lot that like I, I've never seen that image, the the old friends poster, used as much as I have in the last couple of days. Um, because that was one of the first times that people got super hyped about that. And obviously, some of the other books, Avatar Legacy, Legacy of the Fire Nation, stuff like that, has has given us uh, other art official art of the characters when they're older um but this movie is going to be very important to finally fill in that uh, final gap um and it's needed it, i don't think this is just them doing like a nostalgia thing or doing the most popular thing it's been long enough now that this is absolutely needed it makes business sense but it's also a story that does need to be told. We, we need to have uh, at least one more major story in there to fill in the gap and just, you know, give everyone what they've always wanted. Um, and in that sense, it's a weird announcement because that's all it is. It's literally just Janet Varney saying a couple of words. There's no visuals to go along with it. Um, the announcement itself is actually super vague and is only big because we technically know so little officially. Um, so that's always been a bit of a, a weird one to me. Um, but again, going in, not expecting anything, I completely understand why like they, they felt they needed to say something and just put it in there. Um, it was kind of telling uh, if you were kind of on Twitter, kind of following the whole thing. There was barely any, like, interest in what actually was happening in the rest of the panel. Um, in that, I, I don't, I don't even know who the guests were at the panel. I think I saw one clip of like that the Nickelodeon Twitter account put put up of uh, Dante kind of mentioning something, um, but I don't even know what happened in the rest of it. Uh, that's kind of um, the the way it ultimately went. So, um, you know, surprise. Um, the new one, though, we'll get into this, we'll go through this. Um, bit of a story behind this one in that I didn't really expect news from the publishing panel yesterday at all. I, I really didn't expect news from the publishing panel. Um, until they said, Dark Horse said ahead of time that there would be exciting news, and then suddenly everyone's like, oh, okay, I guess you're following up yesterday with something. 
uh, Dark Horse especially needed to do that, so that was cool. Um, it was a little weird, obviously, because there was only one person on like the entire internet uh, posting information from the panel, and I think even in the hour or so immediately following it, I think there was like one other person who posted the really low quality image of this cover and it took them a few hours to actually put out the official information but anyway when we finally got it of course we got the uh, the first reveal here was that we get a new avatar comic coming and that is azula in the spirit temple uh they recently confirmed it is going to be faith aaron hicks and peter wartman as the main creative team so a uh, writer and artist um and summer 2023 is the release date that they're saying for this so that likely means probably i'd say july at the absolute earliest assuming there's no delays or anything like that um in terms of other stuff uh faith aaron hicks on twitter said this ridiculously excited about this book uh, i get to take azula on a super dark journey and peter wartman knocks it out of the park it's an azula story i've been dying to write so very interesting to see how times have changed for Faith Aaron Hicks from a couple of years ago, more or less saying that she's uh, like afraid uh, to write Azula because of how the fandom might take it to slowly actually being like, hey, actually, I kind of would like to write Azula too. Now she's writing Azula on a super dark journey. So very, very interesting stuff. Um the other news, they just, uh, there's no visuals with this one. It's just uh, more Legend of Korra comics are on the way. A new trilogy, so they confirm it's a trilogy. Creators include uh, Kiku Hughes and Alexandria Monique. Uh, this will also be 2023. Uh, more details to come, and they say uh, announcements with all details will be made when they're ready for pre-order. So interpret that as basically when they put up the product listings uh, is when we will get the actual uh like details on the book uh, like the description i'm assuming um and obviously when they say 2023 here i'm assuming this means it will be out after this because they don't have um uh, an estimate or anything like that so i'm guessing that will be the late 2023 for the first part and then everything else will be probably 2024 still that makes for a better lineup than they had this year or the year before pretty much um so it is pretty exciting. So just some brief speculation here before we jump over to Yang Chen. Um, Azula and the Spirit Temple. So interesting cover. Um, not a lot you can make out other than that. Obviously, this is Azula walking into the Spirit Temple. Um, and there's smoke. So, you know, Kimura, we're thinking Kage stuff here. So, okay, there's smoke. And then the smoke in the air has pretty kind of clear patterns to it so it makes it almost feel like is this like a smoke spirit that we're seeing here because it looks like there's eyes here uh, uh under the a and under the or it definitely feels like that is a kind of noticeable pattern here and there's a difference between that and just the general smoke on the ground uh, or mist whatever way you want to call it um the cloak, you know, it doesn't really clearly resemble her Kamurakage cloak, so I don't think it's the exact same thing. Um, so it's hard to tell um, what exactly, you know, really we're, we're doing here. Uh, I know everyone wants to jump to this is the Azula story we have been waiting for, It'd be like the, the continuation of Smoke and Shadow. It might very well be that, but I don't think this is going to be like the azula comic i think this is a azula comic that might set up stuff give her a slightly different direction and um, be sort of a, a prequel a prelude uh, ahead of maybe her being a focus of the um movie or or whatever um it's hard to say because either it's post smoke and shadow it's in between the search and smoke and shadow or it's set during the show they're kind of your options for this, ultimately. Um, I'm not really sure, because like we haven't really seen Azula mention spirits apart from Kamurakage stuff. So I'm maybe wondering, like, I, I tend to assume that it's a one-shot comic. It's going to be, what, 72 pages. I assume they're going to keep that format. This will probably be the first of a trilogy of one-shot comics, though they haven't confirmed that, but I'm assuming... We'll see more Faith Aaron Hicks and Peter Wartman after this. Um, 
So that immediately makes me think they're not going to go all out and this won't be the biggest comic we've ever seen before. So I think, you know, the big Azula character stuff will have to wait a little bit. So it'll be something a little bit more minimal. I maybe lean towards it being a little bit of a fill in the gap between the search and smoke and shadow. Um, it'd be cool if this maybe explains the whole smoke aspect of the Kamurakage. Because uh, they were obviously uh, using that throughout Smoke and Shadow to sort of, um, you know, disrupt the people they were around. But it was never made clear how exactly they're producing the smoke uh, or anything like that. Um, because we don't even know if, like, the other fire warriors are necessarily firebenders and they could all seemingly do it. Now, we know firebenders can generate smoke. But obviously, they don't have a, a, a super amount of control over it uh, as such. So is this maybe explaining some aspect of that? It seems a little bit technical if that's maybe what it is. Um, but who knows? I, I, I'm excited to see where they go with this in terms of like the big Azula stuff obviously is going to have to involve like her family in some way. So I, I really don't think we're going to go anywhere near Ursa in this unless she actually encounters a spirit and is shown some sort of a like vision type thing um that would actually be quite cool it would be really interesting if a spirit showed her a vision and this is what explains her turn in smoke and shadow the whole idea of i know it's not my destiny to be the fire lord anymore i wonder if we might get to see something like that that would be somewhat interesting i think um but it, it's hard to say like I, I i don't even want to read too much into like her outfit and stuff like that people have pointed out that like it's it's more it's maybe more representative of the way she looks in the show rather than the outfit she wears in like say the search but who knows it's it's interesting still blue fire and then yeah just pattern on the top is somewhat interesting um so there's that there we go um so yeah, pretty exciting stuff. Uh, as for the Korra comics, um, they don't give you they, go, they don't give any details. The main question I'd have with the Korra comic is: Is this in any way related to the trilogy they all but announced like two years ago? The one we've been waiting for that seemed to have been put on hold because of Avatar Studios. Is this that just finally happening this time? Or is this something different? Um, it, it's interesting because like obviously Kiku, Kiku Hughes is, I guess the order here makes sense. Like writer and then Alexandra Monique is going to be our artist. So Kiku Hughes has done art and writing before. She does art on Origami from the um, Team Avatar Tales, um, which is, is nice, but I don't think will be an art style suited for like a full trilogy. Um, so it makes more sense that I think she is the writer because I thought Clearing the Air, which she wrote, was uh, really, really well written. Alexandria Monique, uh, as of now, I don't think we have seen official work on Avatar Korra. I think if you look up her art, you can find that she's done some fan art about Avatar and Korra. Uh, and then if you look up stuff on Patterns in Time... I think she is involved in one of the stories for Patterns in Time as well. So um, we might get to see some of her work uh, just before the end of the year. Because, yeah, I, I guess technically that is something that happened over San Diego Comic-Con. It wasn't related to Comic-Con, but Patterns in Time was delayed again. Only by a week, so uh, November 22nd to November 29th. But still, another delay for that book. Um, who knows what's happening here. Other than that, I, I don't think we have much sense for what actually happened at the panel. In that I think a few times it's been asked in chat there, was there any Magpie news? Because it was a, it was a Abrams, Magpie, and Dark Horse panel. The only thing I heard about uh, Magpie was that they mentioned, I think, the, the stuff that is basically from the Kickstarter update. I think they had like a physical copy of the main book there on stage, but I don't know if they actually said anything about anything. Um, the, the person who was live tweeting it uh, didn't really say anything and I hadn't, I didn't hear much else myself. So uh, I'm guessing 
they pretty much just recap their latest Kickstarter update is, is probably the impression that I get. Um, because it, it's a weird thing where like that book, people only know about that book or have that book because of the Kickstarter. They're probably not quite ready yet to announce when it's available for like public sale or anything. So it would be weird to announce like other stuff when they're in that sort of uh, weird position. And especially because they don't have an estimate for when the physical stuff is actually shipping out for backers. They're in a kind of bit of an awkward situation. Um, so there's that. And then Abrams, like, uh, I don't know. Uh, FCE answered a few questions, I guess. But uh, I think it was a weird situation. The book has only just come out. Like when, when the panel happened, like it was like, what, two days before the book had just released. There was never going to be anything super substantial, especially when he'd already announced that there is going to be a second Yang Chen book. There wasn't really much else to say. Uh, if you are interested in FCE stuff, uh, I think he he recently did an in a podcast interview. Uh, I'd have to take some while to look up uh, where I saw that one, but there's a relatively recent podcast interview with him that goes uh, into a little bit uh, more depth. It doesn't really cover spoilers, I think, for Don of Yang Chen, but if you want more about sort of the more detail on the creative process, I think he goes into it there. So that's uh, somewhat interesting. Um. So yeah, with that out of the way, I guess we will switch over to uh, Dawn of Yang Chen and the discussion. So again, final spoiler warning here because we're going to be jumping in here, not straight into the really obvious spoiler, but you know, there'll be stuff that comes up straight away that we will need to talk about. So anyone who doesn't want spoilers, um, you know, this is your final warning, basically. Um, I've been waiting to properly, I suppose, talk about this book for, for quite a while because uh, obviously I've, I've had the book since uh, the 1st of July, so uh, this is like week four of the book for me, um, even though I know most people have only had it like five days, if even that, so um, anyway, but so, so there we go, spoilers. So you can see here, I have quite a detailed document here with um, all the, the information I, it's not everything, there's obviously certain details that I don't have here, stuff that uh, I didn't want to spend like hours putting it together, but you know, have a lot of the world building stuff here and so on, and we can go through it. So, um, I'll start off with just some, some general thoughts on the book, uh, more of a kind of review style thing, because obviously when I did my reviews, it was like the 1st and 2nd of July when I uh, did the, the non-spoiler and spoiler review. Since then, I've just been doing like individual chapter analysis videos. Um, so I haven't had a, a massive opportunity to talk in general about the book. Um, I still maintain a, a lot of what I said in my initial spoiler, non-spoiler review is true. Um, I still think it's it's three out of three for the books. I think it's three really high quality books. I do still think I prefer both Kyoshi books over this one. But the main reason for that is that the Dawn of Yang Chen, I think much more than The Rise of Kyoshi, is a part one. And book four, uh, Dawn of Yang Chen 2, whatever you want to call it, um, that book has the potential to maybe be the best novel that we've had. And the reason for that is that if you've read The Dawn of Yang Chen, you will know that it is a fact about the book that every plot thread is basically left open going into the next book. It doesn't really resolve that much stuff. Maybe you can say Zhang Du Hanshe as the like villain. He is out of action. Everything else is still a hundred percent like in play and open. So the next book is going to be a lot of resolution. Uh, resolution, I assume. And in that sense, like I can understand like a little bit of frustration with this book because it's a massive setup. And then it sort of resolves things quite quickly for its plot, but then sets up the idea that everything is still in play for the next book. So it, it's a weird one where Rise of Kyoshi feels like it's a good book on its own. And then it has a few little set of points that you really want to know about, but the book still fundamentally works on its own. And then uh, Shadow plays on those two points as basically its main plot but also has, you know, the whole Fire Nation switch of the story. So it, it's an interesting point with that regard. I think you could criticize the book for not having a 
ton of action. And when I say that, I, I really mean for not really having much action at all. And the action that is there not being the most exciting Avatar action that we've ever seen. It is a different style of book. It's not meant to be all about just, you know, I challenge you to a one-on-one -on -one duel and we throw everything at each other. But, um, you know, it, it, it works because of the whole sort of spy aspect, you know, Yang Chen being a spy master as well as a diplomat, that sort of reveal. But there really isn't that much to go into with a lot of the action that we see in this book. Um, and then, as is mentioned in the chat there, I would say that it, there's a slight element of a, of a critique slash uh, disappointment you could definitely have with the book based on how they do the sort of like haunted by the memories of uh, avatars before her situation over the course of the book. Um, it feels like this is a thing that they really want to set up right at the start of the book. But then he really doesn't want to give you any specifics on any avatar. And it's really notable when you do get the subtle moments of like her remembering like the fear of a past avatar. And then there's some sort of a vague thing about like, and she never found out who that avatar was. Or, well, surely among all the avatars that there were, there must have been an avatar who was claustrophobic or something like that. Um, they do it right at the start. You get the whole avatar goon thing. But even then, it's relatively low-key. And, like, I don't think there's the same excitement ar around Avatar Goon as there is around um, even, say, Avatar Salai. So I'm hoping in the next book they find some way to do something with that. Even if it's just her having, like, a more open heart-to-heart -heart with Avatar Zito, I would like to get an actual past life scene now i understand in all of this the point of this book is that for yang chen specifically the past lives can't help her in the specific way that she needs help and that's the entire point of that scene later on in the book with uh, mama ayunarak that she presents the idea of yeah uh, you and likely other, other other people expect that I can just talk to my past lives and learn the wisdom of the entire world of every era past but this era is unique it's different they don't have a take that is valid for this era and this is what we basically saw I think this is them trying to play more with the idea from say like the promise that Roku fundamentally can't really help Aang with the whole idea idea of Yu Dao because he never encountered the exact thing that Aang is encountering and it's it's in a way a kind of interesting reveal about how past avatar conversations work that they the, the book makes it sort of clear they can't really give a informed opinion on the current era necessarily which is why I think most of the scenes with that past avatars end up being like, this is my wisdom to you. This is the learning from my life rather than here's how you should handle this situation. But I still think it's a little bit, you know, after the first books actually gave us stuff about like a few new avatars, the tease of this book was that theoretically we could learn about a bunch of avatars, but we don't really um, so th th there's that whole thing. Um, it's it's very, very uh, kind of unusual when it comes to that point. So um, they're my more kind of like general thoughts in terms of my, my sort of like criticisms with the book. Otherwise, I actually think like the characterization of Yang Chen is good. I, I like Kavik as a character. I'm very interested to see where they go in the next book and if they have a reunion. Um I liked the fact that, in a way, the plot was more about an, a, a kind of fully realized avatar trying to accomplish something rather than the plot being about the journey or something like that. Um, that obviously is why... Um, th th that's obviously why... Um, what am I trying to say here? Um, I think more people will 
preferred the Kiyoshi books because the the plot of those books is the character journey into in terms of becoming the avatar whereas this is a avatar who is extraordinarily competent trying to do her job in the most competent way possible and then what does she do when the obvious way doesn't work and i did enjoy that but i do think ultimately this book is going to very much depend on what its follow-up does so uh let's go just through this so so the first thing i have here is just the kind of main world building thing of this the shang cities are effectively in these books like its version of the dao fei it's the new sort of world building dynamic that defines the era of yang chen it was all about bandits and pirates in uh, Kyoshi's era and sort of corrupt earth sages here we're all about the shang cities the shang merchants and um the zongdus so we get the introduction of these four cities bin er which is a kind of city in the north it's i say northern water tribe here but like obviously it's in the earth kingdom but it's northern water tribe like related john Dury is the fire nation uh Shang City, Port Tugak is the uh, Southern Water Tribe city, but obviously it's, it's on an island near the Southern Water Tribe, not in the island itself. And then the mysterious one, Taku, which is mentioned a few times, but never really explored in any detail in this book. This is what uh, FCE said would maybe be where a lot of the second book is set. So I find that to be quite interesting in terms of what we're actually going to do in taku because obviously this is the one place that we've heard about before this is where part of the blue spirit takes place um whereas the other three are completely new places to us um we learned that uh, the shang cities exist because of the platinum affair um and the they become autonomous trading cities and um, this was a very interesting part of the book when we finally got it in the chapters from hansha's perspective that they were initially given to sort of noble families, like trusted noble families to, to lead the uh, Shang cities. But then it changed and it just became this role that people basically like bid for. You buy it. And most of the Shangs just have this perspective on it of like, you become a Zongdu, you go into extreme debt to achieve that role. You then make money from the way the role works and the sort of, in a way, the the autonomous aspect of the city allows you to make. And then you get out. This is why no one, for the most part, ever wants to keep power um, for, for a long period of time. Because I suppose in their minds, the quicker they can make their money and get out, the better. That's why, I suppose, in just eight years, we're already talking about there being sort of generations of shang merchants even though it, it it's only been in existence for eight years um and then obviously like the, the plot occurs because yang chen threatens to inform the earth king of their illicit dealings highlighting how much control the three main nations have over them and we obviously have hansha going completely sort of uh, a little bit crazy with uh, his reaction to this uh, then we get into the platinum affair and, and this was an interesting one just in terms of writing this document I knew I'd finally gotten to the point where I fully understand this book when I went to write this document and I wrote the whole section on the Platinum Affair without ever once looking at the book. And I was just like, yeah, I know all the names, most of the main details, and I think it's all spelled properly as well. And I was just like, yes, <laughs> finally uh, got some of these details in my head. So obviously, like I said, Platinum Affair, key event. I'm wondering in the next book if we might get more detail on this. Um, I'm not really suspicious of the idea that there might be more to it than meets the eye, but I'm just wondering is there a little bit more uh, to it than we know about. So eight years ago, we get this rebellion in the Earth Kingdom, kingdom led by General Nong, and we get the, uh, the High Chief of the Northern Water Tribe and the Fire Lord choose to back Nong in this um, conflict, but not in an obvious way that will get them you know, clearly in trouble that like they're favoring one side or the other. They're kind of trying to back both sides, but favor one or the other. Um, they give paper banknotes to the Earth King, but platinum to Nong. Then this is the big moment here. The Earth King 
suddenly strikes and just full on wins the conflict. It's described as it being sort of like a standoff ahead of time. And then he finds out what's happening here and just goes for it and defeats Nong at uh, Lama Paka's crossing, claims the platinum, keeps the banknotes. He wins this incident and then effectively changes the dynamic between the nations for the time going forward. He stops trade and communication with the other nations and it won't resume until the platinum dulls. Uh, specifically, he plates his badger mole statue in platinum and then he basically says, only when it starts to fade and dull will we, you know, resume things. And obviously the idea is that platinum is this really sort of pure metal. It'll take a long time to uh, actually dull. So um, he's effectively saying that this what he's doing here will last the entire era that he is king and potentially onwards. So in response to sort of save face, the Fire Nation and Water Tribe also stop trade, but they all still want the goods that the others offer. So this is where we get the idea of the formation of the Zhang trade cities and the Zhang merchants, and they're formed to facilitate international trade in a way where the nations aren't directly dealing with each other. Instead, it's with these... Um, like I said up here, uh, like autonomous kind of cities. So we get the idea that there's still no great relationship between the nations with only the air nomads kind of going on as usual, which I do really like. I like that detail in all of this, that the three other nations just seem to hate each other in the aftermath of this. But the air nomads are just like, they basically all get sort of like passes to kind of go about things as usual more or less and and um, this is what i love about these books in terms of exploring eras that actually have the air nomads uh you know in the world is that we're really getting the sense for like just how respected they were and um, that no one really had any quarrel with them in the middle of wild international disputes so super interesting stuff i i, I love the section where they actually like explain um all this stuff and, and how it actually works um, because you know I, obviously they go into a little bit more detail on it in that like the Zongdus are the ones who are like obviously in charge of each city and then they have to give some of the, the sort of like customs and taxes to you know the chief the fire lord and uh, the earth king so um, that's a, a lot of the really cool setup stuff so uh, I suppose we go into Yang Chen here uh, and get into some character stuff and all the kind of key aspects here. So first up is, is this one here. Now, in the grand scheme of the book, it's actually not covered a massive amount. It's like right at the start, chapter 30, I believe, focuses on this as well. Uh, and a bit of, I think, chapter 31. Um, or is it 29 and 30? I forget. Um, either way, the idea is that Jetson is effectively the Gyatso character for Yang Chen. And we get from the early chapters, of course, she's a character who helps Yang Chen meditate in the spirit world, always the character to look out for her. And it goes wrong. This is where we get one of these past avatar memory sort of incidents in terms of how it happens. She suddenly re remembers effectively that a past avatar was terribly, terribly afraid of the spirit world and potentially spirits. Um, this causes her to freeze, it causes spirits to go dark, and Jetson has to sacrifice herself to save Yang Chen. Uh, some really cool stuff here about like the idea of like Yang Chen also sort of like turns into a, a really young child again, and she obviously changes the world uh, with her emotions and has to be like thrown into the air in the spirit world to wake up. Um, really nice references to book two, I, I really appreciate that. Um, but the book all but says she's trapped in the fog of lost souls. Um, j just for anyone in the chat there, like, is there anyone who thinks it's not the fog of lost souls? Um, I'm pretty sure it is. And it's just that obviously in this era, it's not particularly known about or Yang Chen has yet to find some ancient text that references it. Um, I feel like it's mentioned as being like missed at one point. The fact that when she gets the vision from the phoenix eels and she's seeing th 
from Jetson's perspective and there's other people that I think is what confer- confirms it. So it's, I, I think it's it's definitely that. Um, so this is just sort of left in place in the book. Yang Chen vows that someday she will find Jetson. And it's the clearest setup, I think, for like a, a Yang, Yang Chen major character moment. Because obviously this event has, in a way, like very much defined Yang Chen, this is her failure, and we'll see with Kavik that he has a sort of somewhat similar failure in his own past. Um, and I think for, for Yang Chen to not sort of be so, in a way, harsh on herself, she has to get some resolution about what happened here. Um, like, like it's talked about, it's this idea that she, in a way, needs to prove to herself that she can go back to that area. She can find those sure sure spirits and not be afraid of them again when she encounters them uh that's that's a really interesting dynamic and it's it's one of the most interesting parts of speculation for the next book is obviously about um one how will she find jetson and then two when she does what happens to jetson because as far as we're aware you know if Jetson is just freed from the fog of lost souls and sort of regains her her mind effectively again, things go back to normal for her, and she's not insane or something like that, like we saw Zhao was, if she is, has some sense of composure, she can stay in the spirit world and become a spirit over time. And that would basically allow Yang Chen to kind of have somewhat regular conversations with Jetson if she wanted to. Or... Is there going to be some sort of reveal or of can can you make the decision to try and go back into the physical world, but because her body isn't there anymore, she can co- like complete her death? Can you actually choose to pass on instead of like, in a way, at this stage being forced to kind of persist? That would be a really cool reveal to kind of get that. Um... It, I, I can see it happening either way. It would be cool for an avatar, to, one of their companions, to become a spirit, um, and have like another Iroh-like example of a character like that. Um, but it also, I think, would be very. It would be a very emotional scene for Yang Chen to, I suppose, finally get that closure of seeing sort of Jetson pass on and, in a way, make the decision that she doesn't want to remain here forever. Um, that's that's something I'm I'm super interested to see them doing it here because again it's one of these things it's so clearly set up it feels like there's no way they're not going to address it properly so um, I'm I, I I obviously love the spirit mechanics so uh, I'm so excited to see how they actually go about doing this so um, the 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 influence of Jetson I thought was was very nicely done because it's uh, it's the answer to I suppose one of the two characters who we know from the Kyoshi novels die to protect Yang Chen at some point in her life. Now, maybe it's a different incident, but there's at least one other companion, I suppose, that we might see die. Um, So maybe that will be the second book, and it will be interesting to see what exactly happens here. I think it's described as, like, friends and bending teachers, so I don't know if it, it means both characters have to be bending teachers or anything like that because Jetson I think we can assume probably thought Yang Chen to a certain degree uh, and that fits the category but you're kind of wondering like were they going to do like a Kavik death in the next book or like Boma but we don't know what the deal is with Boma for the most part he's not really covered too much other than like hey it's Boma um so uh that that to me is quite interesting and then there's always the room for, like, what if they introduce some new characters who become her companions? Um, but, like it says, it has to be bending teachers, and I don't think we know who they are, so that's interesting. Then we go into this one. So, again, these are some of the stuff from early on in the book, past Avatar's memories. So, like I said, here, let's hear, uh, mostly in control of it now. Uh, it's described that, uh, what is it, Abbas Dagmola gave her exercises to keep it in check. But the, the book talks a little bit about how, like, 
she doesn't do them as regularly anymore or like sometimes she gets distracted doing them and doesn't complete them and these really help her to keep in her own mind because the way they describe it is almost that like if she doesn't do them she can wake up and she almost is another avatar or something like that that she does have trouble at times uh figuring out whose memories are who and like the idea of waking up is a bit of a challenge for yang chen both in the returning from the spirit world sense but also just full stop waking up um and so this is sort of why in this book we begin to see these little things these little kind of triggers begin to impact her again so the examples we get over the course of the book are uh the idea of like the a previous avatar or multiple avatars were claustrophobic in some way um when she goes to Inca Island, there's clearly a sense that some fire avatars from the past uh, are sort of, in a way, terrified at the idea of their honor, uh, not th them being dishonored and having to, you know, cut off their top knot. She seems like really, really upset when she sees the uh, the box of uh, top knots uh, that's given to her. Um, so the, there's that and and there's other kind of little moments sort of like as we go on where we see that obviously the the spirit world uh one is an example and i think there's like one other one or something like that if i remember correctly um obviously the one for the very start of the book is the idea we don't really see what triggered it but it's when it was less controlled she obviously has the idea of being afraid of um you know tsunamis and 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 what happened there with Avatar Goon and uh, Masose. Uh, so I like this in concept, but I really do think though all of those scenes would hit so much harder if they actually said in some way like that. Like Yang Chen knew that it's this specific Avatar and this is what happened because. If you if you listen to what FC Ye Yi says about things when he talks about things, it seems like uh, Escape from the Spirit World is a major source that he uses for the writing of these books. And the whole idea of that story is that Aang reconnects to Rava, basically, by talking to the previous four avatars. So we actually, for a lot, of, in, in, in many ways, like that, the first time we see a few of these avatars... So they're specific about it. And the whole idea is that Aang learns this lesson about every avatar having their failures. And so he has just gone through one of his failures. And it's a very, very notable story. And in a way, that's what FCE is trying to do here with this book. But because he is not super specific with it, it doesn't hit anywhere near as hard as those other examples do. In that... It would be very interesting, but also very dark to maybe know that there was an avatar who like died in some sort of a like cramped circumstances, like a cave in or something like that. And um, just to know that sh the reason this is coming through is because it's a heavy, heavy emotion. Whereas the way the book describes it, it feels like it almost like diminishes the actual like fear by just saying, well, like, of course, in one of the, like, you know, you know, how many avatars there were, one or two of them must have been like this. It just makes it feel like it's less important in some ways. Um, that, that's, that's my kind of issue with this. I, I, I needed some more specifics to actually make this work because it does feel like he relies in this book very heavily on vagueness around like oh i talked to dozens of past avatars and learned the exact same lesson from all of them that point later on in the book i think is somewhat okay but i think the individual examples needed to be a little bit better now i, I think it didn't make much sense perhaps if they had to do the chapter one thing over and over and over again but with how knowledgeable yang chen seems to be it kind of feels like, well, she has all these memories. She should remember, like, who these avatars are in some way. Um, so, I don't know. Maybe it's just him not wanting, feeling like he needs to reveal all the avatars. Because I, I do understand. You don't want the book to just be all about past life conversation. 
that some people do get a little bit too obsessed with. You should have a past life conversation there when you have to be a little bit more careful about when you do it and stuff like that. Um, it just is frustrating when you have a situation where Yang Chen has like effectively the greatest, like she effectively, it's described as like Mama Yunarak as like a gift to have such a strong connection to all of her past lives. Yet she doesn't, it seemed like, reference it at any like point specifically that she does this because she learned it from this avatar or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's an interesting point. Um, so question there in chat. Uh, have I read Dune? I, I started reading it, uh, but I, I just got distracted. It wasn't because the book was bad. I think I like halfway through. I enjoyed it and I'll get back to it at some point, but that's that. Do you think Yang Chen has ever talked to any past avatar? I get the impression she's only seen memory visions instead of actively talking. Um, I'll read out a section from this. Let me see, can I find it somewhat quickly? Because I, I remembered this from when I listened to the audio book. Um, where are we going here? It's, it's one of the chapters I'm about to go to next in it. It's the coming up. So she mentions this when she finally opens up to Mama Ayunarak. So it's not this chapter, it's the next one. Um, but I believe she does say that she has actually like properly talked about it. Um, let's see. Uh, so that's that. Oh yeah, yeah, here we go. Um... So yeah, yeah. I only let the elders know about a fraction of my successes. I spoke to dozens of previous avatars upon dozens upon dozens. Um, I saw through their eyes, watched their lives unfurl. Time doesn't pass the same way inside a vision as it does inside the physical world. Uh, as first I was overwhelmed by us all. Uh, da -da -da -da. Information. Uh, I sat in front of my predecessors humbly asked so many questions, listened to so many answers. Do you know what I learned? Their lives are full of regret. So if you take that somewhat literally, it does get across the idea that she has had past Avatar conversations in a similar way to the way we've seen like Aang, for instance, typically do it. Actually talk to them, not just the full basically like memories of their entire life so it seems like she actually is very good at this and she's effectively learned how to channel her gift properly when when she wants to use it uh, and she can do it in the more typical way um but obviously the the point that is made here is that um she more speaks to the general learning from this was just that all the avatars regret not acting enough because the the theme of this and it's uh this this point here yang chen chooses to be this extremely active avatar speaking to the past lives has shown her nothing but regrets for not doing enough so this is the whole um you you know you rather parry the sword than heal the wound that perspective this is effectively where she sort of like gets that from is that she views the idea of waiting to deal with an incident once it has happened as being too late and that she needs to act the second there is a sign of danger um wait did she go in order or just skip around uh they do not make that clear it depends on how she she does it uh, again based on the way we know the avatar connection works to go far enough back you have to go in order but we don't know how that works with yang chen because she seems to just be like open to sort of like any and every avatar at almost the same time uh plus we don't even know what exactly the issue is that is allowing this to happen but the idea i assume is when she does the ones where it's more controlled and she chooses to converse with a past avatar she likely does have to go in order and the and the point that i think is being made here is that she basically says she goes back dozens upon dozens upon dozens so if you take that literally she's gone back at least 36 avatars and 
talk to them all about this. She's put in the time, put in the effort, and in her mind, it hasn't been the most useful thing, effectively. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, I think she's lying here. Later, she thinks the opposite, that she's never talked with an avatar in the conversation with the Earth King about Zito. Uh, okay, this is a section where, I, I th th this is where they play on the nuance of what she can actually talk to a past avatar about. I don't think she's trying to say she can't talk to Zito, but she's what she's saying is she can't basically relay her present situation to Zito and then ask him, what would you do in this situation? Because the way they're basically saying it is that in response to that, the past life avatar Zito can only effectively say something along the lines of, in my day, I would handle diplomatic situations in this way. And it's not him specifically tackling the problem she has like asked of him. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of subtle point that I think they're trying to make here, which is just that she can't just be Zito. That's not how, how it works. That, she describes it, that's how people think it works. That people think that when she talks to Zito, it's as if Zito is full on alive again, but now has the full context of the present day when that isn't actually the case. He can still only ever really talk about things from his perspective. They they do... He, the wording on it is so weird in that, like, there's an attempt to be like, oh, like, they are slightly aware of the present day situation, but they can never be fully up to speed with it. So it, it's just enough to sort of explain how it like works in any sense. But I think it works. It's just a weird one to try and explain that this is actually how it works. And um, so my interpretation from that would be that she has conversed with a bunch of avatars before. It's just that those conversations are never as useful as you think they theoretically could be. Which is why, like I said earlier on at the start of this conversation, is that... <sighs> what am I trying to say here? It's, it's a very complicated topic. Um, the, the dynamic here is just that they nearly every situation is, this is what I learned from my life. Or, this is how I tackled this situation in my time. They can't directly be like, Oh, so that's what you're dealing with. You've got this, this, and this. This is what I do. Um, so it's that weird thing of like, it's like they are just themselves as they died, but with the slightest amount of present day context so that the conversation can actually happen. Um, okay, can we have the Kiyoshi and Suki alone conversation? Um, okay, like this is one of the most complicated ones. Why can... Kiyoshi appear before Suki and how exactly does that happen um look it, it's so difficult because it's a situation where like okay there has to be an avatar being aware of a present situation to appear before Suki yes there's a sort of somewhat spiritual connection because it's Suki has a connection to basically Kiyoshi because she knows Aang. Aang doesn't know Suki's in danger, but there is a slight sense that, I suppose, Rava slash past avatars are somewhat aware of what's going on, hence why the defense mechanism avatar state can even work in the first place. Like, who knows the avatar is in danger enough for that to, to need to be activated. Um, so... I'm guessing it's probably just some situation where like the actual explanation for this is that at the time when that happens is maybe when Team Avatar is somewhat close to Suki's location. She's at a very emotional moment and that just somehow connects with Aang somehow spiritually and it happens. Um, it's one of those moments where it's like, it's really cool. I like that it happened but I don't know how to explain it properly. 
Um, so there, there's there's that aspect of it as well. Um, and then yeah, this this brings up the whole idea there uh, of do we then have to have the interpretation that the past lives are the actual spirits of those avatars? I, I personally don't think that is the case. I, I think this book and how it explains what happens really has me, even I, I think, even more leaning into the direction of that it is a just like Rava construct of the Avatar as they were effectively type thing. Um, again, it's it's very complicated because, you know, they're effectively talking to like themselves. And so that Avatar is effectively using an aspect of the spirit that they used to own quote unquote the wording out here is really weird um so they are alive again it's just that every memory doesn't cross over in that way <laughs> um it's it's so it's so weird to talk about um so there's that i i want i'd like at least one or two specific examples in the next book um Yeah, yeah, that's probably the best way to, to describe it there uh, by Miss Mystic uh, Philosopher in chat there. I feel like the advice past avatars gives the current avatar perspectives on how they solve situations in their day so the current avatar can form a solution giving inspiration, sort of. So, yeah, so it's a situation where, like, you can have a full-on conversation with a past avatar about their life because they know their life more than anything. And they, you can ask them general questions about, like, theory. But they can never have a perspective that is completely, like, the same as the current avatar on the, the current situation. That, that's, that feels like the best way to, to talk about it. Um, so we'll move on before we get completely bogged down with spirit talk here. Um, we can have more streams where we talk about lore later on. There's more stuff to go through. Um, Yang Chen, uh, I really like this bit of the book. I love how it mentions uh, Tian Hai Shir, um, and what happened here. One, naming the place from the rift was fantastic. But also that this is, I suppose, one of the instances where we see Yang Chen become this extremely active avatar is that the the avatar people expect her, expect her to be is the one that made the deal and fought general old iron but the avatar that i think people never think about is the one who resolves the aftermath and this in her mind was the more complicated part of the situation because she had effectively the third largest city in the earth kingdom this amazing growing city and suddenly no one can live here anymore we have to get rid of this town as part of this deal with this spirit all of these people need to be placed somewhere else they, we can't go back to the town we can't temporarily use it no we got to get out of here straight away and the way to describe the idea of that like it had to be this combined effort of Yang Chen and a bunch of the fellow, fellow air nomads um, basically getting charity from anywhere around and Yang Chen realizing that no one is just going to take in all these people because I ask. So this is where she starts manipulating people, doing some lies, finding out information about, ah, if I manipulate it here, I can get these people accepted. And that people die they do describe that people died uh, on this kind of journey to eventually relocate all the people but eventually she did it and in a way that's the thing she's more proud of than the deal with old iron and the fact that a few characters mentioned to her that i'm not even sure it was a spirit i think it was just a tsunami is like the kind of notable thing in all of that um that you know, the no one really goes on to remember this situation because in a way she handled it so well. So interesting stuff. But then, yeah, the Inca Island situation here. So this is a fantastic piece of like connection and reference to all of the FCE material because it references, of course, the idea that 
this is, I suppose, Yang Chen's like one of her earlier uh, instances of dealing with spirits. But this is also the one that gets referenced in the Shadow of Kyoshi. We see this fight happens. Um, we, we, we see the, the description of how Karuk kills this, the, the, this spirit later on. Um, and I think Yang Chen, when she speaks to Kyoshi, even talks about it as well. Um, so uh, fascinating stuff here. And I like it because this helps to explain, I suppose, what Yang Chen talks about there. That the problem in so many ways is the humans. That she creates these deals and she can create deals with the spirits. But the ones who are always in danger of breaking the deals is the humans. Um, and I, I, I love this section of the book because I, I believe up to this point, like Yang Chen has been like pretty like, you know, kind of relaxed for the most part. She gets a bit angry when the cup is thrown at uh, Boma, frustrated with the Shang merchants, but she's furious when she arrives here. And I love how she deals with like the Duke and they know that they did something wrong here, but that they're still trying to say, like, we broke the deal, but... And I, I love the inner dialogue of Yang Chen, of, like, you're trying to explain this away, but I'm not letting you away with it. And the the eels, of course, are dark at this point. And this is the, where the book, I think, does a really good job at... Getting across this idea, like, I think m almost more so than any other piece of Avatar media, that the spirits truly are, like, a, a whole other type of being. They're not just spirits in a weird form. They're, sorry, they're not just humans in, an, in another form. They're a whole other type of being, and so they think about things in extremely different ways. That to them, a deal broken, there's no nuance to it. There's no... It's understandable why you broke that deal. It's just you broke it and so you deserve a punishment. Or if we are going to have another deal, that deal will involve a punishment. And that's what Yang Chen has to do to form this second deal. She has to effectively work with a dark spirit to come up with a lasting punishment for the Sao Wang clan. And again, the connective stuff here is fantastic because this helps to explain why the Sewan clan in the Kyoshi novels is a clan on the rise coming from a low point. This is what brought them low, is that this deal, they broke the deal with the spirits and they to, to keep it for as long as they did up to, I suppose, the, the Karuk stuff. Um, that That's what happened here. Um, and so it's this weird situation of like, you know, Karuk did deal with them like it's it's the last 30 years I suppose that were what finally brought the Sawan clan back into the spotlight only after Karuk had like dealt with them um but that's that's just the situation here it's a uh, really really interesting what they do because like it is described of course that this is a very powerful spirit it's able to do the whole you know inside chakra show a vision situation I do wonder how that works, that they can show Yang Chen a vision of what someone else in the spirit world is seeing, and that someone is in the fog of lost souls. Um, and it's this thing of, like, that's, that's their punishment for Yang Chen. So it obviously speaks to the idea that the Phoenix Eels can, they're aware, one, that Yang Chen has a connection to Jetson, which is why this will hurt Yang Chen. So there's almost like a psychic style connection thing going on here, which is also quite interesting. Um, one interesting thing about this is the whole idea about the wording here. That it basically implies Yang Chen went to the spirit world and then came back out. But they never really establish if she did go in or out um now i think later on in the book they clarify that um a vision can alter alter time um she explains that when when listening to the visions of past avatars 
that can happen like so 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 quickly and it must be the same here and that's what they're talking about with the sort of like time based effect that happens here and um, but again like, we have to also keep in mind that we are still dealing with effectively i suppose the idea that the the phoenix eel spirits are here basically because of like father glowworm effectively and 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 the the portals that he can make and um, so i suppose that's that's still a thing in this era as well um so yeah i think the fog itself is a spirit so maybe there was memory sharing between different spirits definitely an interesting one um let me find that section i think there's there's one little bit of a wording that i'm i'm, I'm interested to see um no i think it's the next chapter yeah the dispute here we go um Oh yeah, it's, uh, Yang Chen says uh, to the Phoenix Eel spirits, let her go. And the Phoenix Eel says, we do not have her. Nothing has her. Nothingness has her. Do you like your gift? It is what she sees and will see forever. So the Phoenix Eel refers to the fog as uh, nothingness, which is very, very interesting. Um, but, you know, not, not too much detail there. Um... With Yang Chen, like, I, well, we have to get into Kavik, I think, to bring a lot of the other Yang Chen stuff into play and the other characters. But I, I, I just say in general with Yang Chen, I was very interested to see what her general characterization would be. But I actually really, really like it. I really like that you have those elements of her, like early on in the book, basically trolling Kavik at the start. She, she just is so funny in those scenes, how she handles those situations. Turning up at his house, the little sarcastic moments, and that sort of continues between her and Kavik over the course of the book. Um, that's really well done. You have the moments where she can lose it. She can get very angry, like she does when Boma gets hurt, when she arrives on Inca Island, and then you have those moments where you see her go out on her own at night to the airball court or she goes down to the tiger dealer's roar and just screams out at the sea and you can sort of see the idea that to be this very uh, active avatar the effort it takes the sheer effort to get anything done what it takes because she effectively I suppose, has to deal with a situation of like everyone has to be respectful to a degree to the avatar but they never have to act on anything she really asks. Um, so no one's being like reasonable with her. She has to be seen as being reasonable herself. But that doesn't get anything done. And so, you know, this idea of the contrast between the avatar people expect her to be and the avatar she has to be to get things done. Uh, as Kavik says in the book, it's like, uh, up here you and down there you who you are at like the air temples when you're super comfortable versus down there where she has to be like the schemer basically. Um, so um, that's, that's interesting, but let's go into Kavik here. Let's, uh, let's switch up here and go to Kavik because we'll get to the Yang Chen Kavik relationship a little bit later on. But um, I found myself really liking him. I, I see, I saw a few reviews of this book on Reddit where people were saying that like he gets so much of the attention in the book. Like he gets so many chapters to himself that like, uh, that was one of the main differences between the books. And that was what maybe held it back a little bit, but I appreciated that because Kavik as a character really kind of serves to highlight that even someone like say Rangi, we didn't actually get too much focus on Rangi in the two Kyoshi books. Whereas Kavik getting, you know, a secondary character treatment here, really makes him stand out that by the end of the book you have this really cool dynamic where like the, it is about these two characters and the paths that they go on and that they have this potentially really really strong partnership as avatar and companion but now it looks like that's maybe changing going into the next book and um, I, I i thought kavik was really well done and and it, and it benefited from the fact that like Similar to Yang Chen having these things from her past, Kavik had the same with his brother. And so the Yang Chen Jetson dynamic and the Kavik Kalyan dynamic, I thought was really, really cool to have over the course of the book. That what happened to Jetson defines Yang Chen to a degree going forward, in the same way that what happened to Kalyan has created this trajectory for Kavik going forward. And 
I love what they do here because you see that when he remembers uh, his brother, it's like he looks up to him as this hero. It's referred to as like uh, Kalyan the, the Great, Kavik the Lesser. So he always, when he thinks of his brother, always puts like an order to it. And, and that is, I think, quite interesting with what they do over the course of the book, that the memories of Kalyan always remind him of his like weaknesses because of that event when he was eight in the blizzard that it's this moment where he wasn't able to do anything and Kalyan saved him and in the aftermath of it Kalyan didn't care he didn't care that he lost two fingers he was just happy to save his brother but Kavik remembers that as I did nothing he lost two fingers because of me and the lengths that he goes to to sort of blame himself for the full situation there like that oh I cursed the hunt uh, I feel like I've almost cursed hunts going forward that this is the reason we ultimately had to move away from the northern water tribe uh, I'm the one who sent Kalyan on this trajectory to become an errand runner and leave the family and cause all these issues that it's very interesting that the way that is connected and and how the book goes of Kavik in the early book is very focused on what he feels like rescuing his brother almost because he doesn't know what happened to him he just left disappeared one day but then he slowly finds out from like Kyu that oh my brother left on his own and just hasn't come back that changes things right at the time when he's becoming Yang Chen's companion and you see like the potential of this like new Kavik um come out that here is this potentially amazing avatar companion who is skilled he's not the most powerful waterbender but he's so clever with how he uses his bending and he has a good mind for like being this like informant errand runner and he has a good heart as we see in a lot of different scenes where he rushes to bring the water in to help that uh, woman who needs healing and um, he wishes that they could go after the the woman's boy a uh, son who who's been lost out in the in in the mountains as well and and you see these ideas of like he acts like there's a little bit of a sort of like almost like shikamaru aspect to him here of just like all this stuff is a drag but if he just applies himself a little bit he he's very very capable and skilled um i and and that's what i really like about the character and right when he's like reaching his peak you get that sudden transition of like he he wins the big fight effectively at the at the dock in John Dury. And he's like, it seems like he's actually come this close to finding out what unanimity is. And then he's brought before the boss boss and it's Kalyan. And all of a sudden everything changes because here is his brother. What he's recently come to think about his brother brother is correct. And he doesn't know how to react to that especially when Kalyan has actually sort of embraced this life. That Kavik sort of does what he's doing to try and find Kalyan, but fundamentally is good at heart and doesn't really, I suppose, want to be a criminal overall. Whereas it feels like Kalyan has full-on embraced that and has and likes be working for a Zongdu and, and so on. That's what I thought was so interesting about all of this um, and I'm, I'm very interested in the chat for your guys uh, what, what your analysis is of that scene when Kalyan talks to Kavik and sort of half like guilts him half sort of like logics him into the betrayal of Yang Chen what are, what are your thoughts on the dynamics going on here between Kavik and uh, and Kalyan? Um, it, it was one of the most interesting ones when I did this chapter in the chapter analysis videos where I'm kind of like, okay, like here's some proper analysis that we have to go into about what what's going on here. I think the big one is definitely that he brings up, Kalyan brings up the idea of like, I saved your life. You owe me. Do this for me. You don't owe her anything. And if in a way Kavik could just be the character from a chapter or two ago around his brother, he wouldn't have done this. 
But because he always remembers himself as being weak around his brother, it comes up again. Like like the fact that they have the wrestling at the start of the chapter and Kalyan sort of lets him beat him up a little bit, but then he just immediately reverses it. There's that sense that like he's not good enough. Um and you really see, I think, at the end of this situation that like, oh, it's really all about business. Like the the sense of family and care between water tribe people isn't really there anymore that moment where he's kind of like well as long as we're being honest with each other yeah i do just want you as a plant in the avatar's retinue like the truth just comes out and kavik just feels like well i don't want i i don't really like the person my brother is but i don't want him to die so i kind of have to do this and he just goes along with it and it's noted like in the book like it's a moment of weakness for for Kavik um but I, I love at the I love just a moment that it happens like I think it's only like two chapters before that you have the big emotional Kavik and Yang Chen moment down at the beach in the in the little cave where she is kind of like the decision to be a companion has always been yours and he he accepts it and then it's just like two chapters later he gets his big moment and basically succeeds, but then the shock happens and, and we go from there. Now, of course, he somewhat redeems himself to a degree because he does do his best to alert Yang Chen to get back to Bin Er, and it just about works out. But obviously, it is a breach of trust that Yang Chen views as being very, very extreme. And so... The book ending with um, them not together as Avatar and Companion is very interesting. That, like it says here, she doesn't know she can trust him anymore. Not a companion anymore. Just an asset. And and that's the thing here of like that Yang Chen is just kind of like, you have done this and you've made it so that like our relationship has to only be business going forward. Um, that you know so much you are only like important to me because you know about unanimity. That's the main thing in their dynamic. But I think there is a glimmer of hope because um, you get the moment, uh, what is it, third last chapter at the end, um, where like Yang Chen has just vis- v- finished visiting the honored guests and um, then the, the, the abbot comes to her room and is just like, oh, I forgot to tell you, um, we found the woman's son. Remember, you saved her uh, with Kavik, was it? Like your companion Kavik. And she suddenly is reminded at this kind of very low moment that um, they did this together. That the same character she can't trust did have moments where like they, they did things together. And so Yang Chen is hurt right now. But I do think if they meet again and Kavik proves himself to her again i think they can get back to maybe what where they were before um i i i'm very interested to see what they do because obviously like the the kavik trajectory at the end of the book is that he's going to come back into play in what seems like a relatively big way because He's basically wanted by the other nations because he was involved in the secret incident that all the world leaders want to know about. And if not for Mama Ayunarak, saving him from the Thin Claws, um, who is like who are the the spies basically for the the Water Tribe chief, you know he'd be dead. So he's being recruited into the Order of the White Lotus, and now. You obviously have a bit of a weird dynamic between Yang Chen and the White Lotus because she seems to not like them at all because she views them as being the ones who wait too much, that they represent the idea of like, like, like a Unirak says, you know, wait, the Avatar and the White Lotus are only meant to kind of come into contact at moments of generational import. Like, she's thinking more in a way almost about the history books than she is about just helping out in a situation. That the secrecy of the organization is more important than just getting things done in a way. 
and and I love it. I I, I think those two chapters where where Unarak and Yang Jian talk are two of the best chapters in the entire book, because you get these two philosophies of like, in a way, this sort of like older kind of spy master who kind of waits for big moments versus a young Yang Chen but who actually knows like effectively the history of the entire world and her um, takeaway from that is you need to be very very active to do things and I like that there's that sense of like Ayunarak is sort of slightly wrong but I don't think she's completely wrong in criticizing some of Yang Chen's approach. Um, and then Yang Chen is correct that like it is not a great approach for the Order of White Lotus to basically ignore certain incidents because they don't seem important to them. Um, but there maybe is some value in not just jumping at everything. Um, it, it's a very complex situation. And so when a Unirak kind of brings up the idea of like, just use your gift, you know, the, the one that you have, you, you more than any, any avatar in history c can, you know, bring back the Gilded Ages just by bringing up the past again. And Yang Chen's just like, hey, I did that. And that's not what I saw. That she from her um, memories, she interprets it as that, like, there's never been gilded ages like you think there are. Um, all the avatars have had regrets, uh, not just certain ones. Um, that's what's so interesting about this, of, like, everyone thinks that if you're the avatar, you have access to just, like, the ultimate wisdom that will solve any problem. But Yang Chen's sort of pointing out that, like, it doesn't, work that way they can't you know properly inform me about my specific situation and um, so it's so so interesting um but uh yeah i i love this different perspective on the owl because i think there's a lot of people in the community the fan base who are just like order of white lotus like best thing ever secret organization they're all the best characters the most knowledgeable ones but there is a sense that like you can look at it as like okay they help in certain key situations but they're also this kind of club who are maybe like a little bit snobby about we're not going to get involved in that like she brings up the whole Tianhai sure thing of like they didn't help with one of the major cities going away and the aftermath of that that I, I, I like that, that it's not just they're the best thing ever as they're sort of presented as in Avatar, that there have maybe been eras where the, the owl has not been, you know, used in the right direction, which is why it makes it actually very interesting that like a lot of people criticize uh, the Order of White Lotus in Korra for not feeling as cool because it's not secret, but it is more out there and actually like kind of doing stuff. And it's kind of like, well, which way do you want it? Where, like, they only wait for the key moments and they're super, super secret. Or they're actually active, but that maybe makes them less cool and important. Um, and and I, I like Yang Chen. Like, like I mentioned in the chat there, you know, Yang Chen just completely mocking the whole code phrase thing of, you know, the lotus opens wide to know those who know her secrets and stuff like that. I I thought that was really well done. And that is arguably one of the most interesting kind of past life memory things that we learned that a past avatar was an ordered white lotus member or learned it from someone. Like, they knew those codes. And who did that happen with? Uh, when did that happen? That's what's uh, very interesting to me. Um, and especially after the the Jinpa stuff from the Kyoshi books was relatively low key. Um, I actually really liked that it was brought more into the forefront. And it looks like in the next book we're going to be doing even more with it. Um, so that's kind of interesting to me. Because obviously like uh, the, the key thing here is that Yang Chen has brought a Unirak 
in on the whole unanimity thing. And unanimity is like key still going into the next book because this book was obviously about revealing what it is. But now that we know what it is, it's like these people cannot know what it is. Otherwise, there's basically going to be a world war over claiming it. And that's what's so so interesting about it. Um, so, yeah, that's really, really interesting. So uh, I suppose just on Kavik before we, we temporarily move on, um, what are people's thoughts heading into the next book? Like, how, how will they do the Kavik Yangchen reunion? Like, will they eventually be friendly with each other again? Will he become a companion again? Will he be the, the other one who dies? Um, or is their relationship forever altered because of this betrayal? That's what I think is, is, is very interesting to consider with all of this. Um, I would like it to go back to he eventually does become a companion again, just because I feel like, I think this book sort of made it clear, Yang Chen needs a companion. I, I think she, she needs someone her own age who is with her, who she can have more of the sort of like witty banter back and forth with and isn't just like Boma who, you know, supports her and is very very loyal to the avatar um and i i think obviously like kavik in a way has to sort of redeem himself in some way but i th think he will and um that's what i'm interested by because i i think with kavik what they're going to do is they're probably going to have him come into contact with kalyan again and they might actually fight and it will be such a massive moment for Kavik to beat Kalyan. I, I think that would be a major moment of growth. To, for him to kind of be. It, the direct proof. I'm not weak. I, I've, I've changed. I'm not the weak you know, boy that I once was. I can beat you now. That you have changed. You're not the, the brother I knew. I think they can do stuff like that. There's a little glimmer with Kalyan. That he does say. And it seems like it's somewhat honest. That like oh I did plan to come back. But it does feel like he's kind of moved on from that a little bit. That, yes, things, the security in Jondari is um, quite heavy. But I think he could have got in touch with the family if he really wanted to. And, and, and I think that's going to be probably like key to it. Um, yeah, I think they'll return as friends. He'll be a companion. It'll be a good hurdle for Yang Chen to overcome. People making mistakes, but making up for it and trusting them again. Yes. Uh, yeah, she definitely has some trust issues. So yeah, I, I think that's kind of what they'll do. Um, I want it to be a companion, but I, I want there to be a rift. Yes, yes, definitely. I, I, I think early on, if they come into contact with each other, it should be a little bit awkward. It shouldn't go straight back to companion. Like if she happens to come across like the owl again and she sees like Kavik there standing behind a Unirak and she's just kind of like, huh? Like that would be cool by itself because she kind of inherently dislikes the organization and to see him part of it would be like a temporarily like double betrayal. But if they're working together, he gets his opportunity to sort of like prove himself again. <laughs> I think that would be quite cool. Um... Next character up, we have uh, Zhongdu Hongshu. I, I, I feel weird every time I say his name. That that's the pronunciation from the audiobook. I feel like I'm almost saying it like in a in a way that almost makes it comes across as uh, French. But um, anyway, that's his name. I was saying I think Henshi before, but it's Hongshu. Um, but anyway, he's the Zhongdu of Bin Er. Uh, he's described as being like, what, 25, mid-20s? Um, and yeah, he is your typical uh, Zongdu. He is the one who wants to do things the way it's usually done. He wants to follow in the footsteps of his predecessor, uh, Dushim, and just get in, make his money, get out. But the thing with him that I think actually makes him interesting is that he's the guy where, like, he wants the easy life, everything goes wrong on his watch that it gets across the idea that the shang merchants the uh especially the zongdus they're not good leaders they are given a position that is effectively a world leadership position but is one that's like bought it's so funny to look at like uh sadao 
early on in the book, ex- like comparing the role to that of an avatar and it making somewhat sense. But then Honshou reveals the, the details of like how he became, how he got that position. And it's like, eh, no. Um, and you see that like he is not a particularly strong leader because he only cares about just making his money and getting out. And that's why they have no interest in actually helping the people. Because that's the interesting thing about the plot of this book. If he was a good leader, there would never really be a major plot in this book because he would have just taken some of Yang Chen's advice, put some of it into action, and that would have naturally calmed down the riots that were happening in Bin Ur and things would have eventually just gone back to normal. The difference is that he would have had to have put, I suppose, some of the money that he's trying to skim off the top into the people and he just didn't want to wait long enough to to make that happen that's what's interesting here of like you see him kind of being like oh why why am i the zongdu that is asked to actually lead that's that's effectively like the 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 idea of this character um he he has one really clever move and it's this obviously he plants kalyan uh in john Dury, and so he has his agent on the inside and this is how he actually claims the unanimity for himself. Um, it's his one big move in all of this. But otherwise you see that he is not playing the game properly. And this is why I think when I did my chapter analysis videos, it's like, this is a Long Feng Azula situation. Zhangdu Chaisi is the Azula, Han Xia is the Long Feng. You know, he does some things right, but ultimately gets completely outplayed in the overall situation. Um, and, and that's the thing. His plan, what, what he actually tries to do, it's kind of like, okay, you don't want to actually put the effort in, like a Yang Chen, to actually do anything to help the people. So you're going to do this thing where you oppose the entire Earth Kingdom military and sort of hold out to try and negotiate... Uh, I suppose effectively for some level of independence for Bin Ur. But even though what unanimity is, is a major threat and more or less can make that happen, it is such a high risk move that he makes. Basically getting into a, a tall tower and just oh, trying to hold off the, the Earth Kingdom army and all these people. It's just too few people against too few many and the numbers just end up not working out for him even though the the sort of power level is there and that's what i what i find so interesting about him and then even like his final scene in the book where where there's at the air temple and he's like oh yang chen like I, i can give you a deal i'll tell you about my plant on the inside and then you'll have something over chai si and yang chen's just like I already know you like I don't even care what you have to say so again just that proof that like okay our main villain for the book was solid but puts a desperate plan into action and it all goes wrong for him and that's uh very interesting um I'm I'm wondering will he play any role going forward there's some sense that I think Yang Chen is going to have to use him in some way because the world leaders have just noted that this guy has gone missing and unless she just wants to lie about like oh i guess he died or something like that um it feels like she'll have to let him go eventually or just hold him under house arrest at the air temple for like months and months until the overall incident resolves itself um no no idea what way they're going to use him going forward but um it's like a weird one where like He's intelligent to a certain degree, but I don't really think he's up to that much. So, um, I, I liked him, I think, overall. I, I think he made for a nice kind of mid-level threat in a book that was about politics and different people getting the advantages over other people and so on. Um, next up, at Zongdu Chaisi. I think she's an incredibly interesting character, even though she's only in like 
two scenes in the book basically and then otherwise it's like two very brief letters that she sends out but the impact that she has on this is, is absolutely fascinating and I feel like she is one of the main characters she probably has to be like one of the main characters in the next book um and because she is the different one she is the Zongdu who it seems like wants to do things in a different way not just keep the position for a small amount of time and leave but actually develop a dynasty for herself on John Dury. so like I said she's a Zongdu of John Dury, the Fire Nation one uh, interesting note is that she is uh, pregnant and she's uh, going to give birth somewhat soon in that I assume there'll be a little bit of a time skip going into the next book where I'm assuming she will have give birth already or there'll be something about some significance to the child in some way in that it's either I think related to a bigger plot or it's just that her having like an an heir uh, and that being like the first time a uh, th and that being the first time uh, a Zongdu is directly sort of like passing on the position is interesting. Um, so Chaisi, I, I I like that because she obviously lies to Yang Chen, I think, and it's just like, oh no, I, I only want to uh, get in and out myself, and and she almost gives across the idea that like I want to get out and settle down with my family. But then Han Shu, who, who knows her better, seems to be able to cut through that and realize that, ah, you, you want to stay in this position for a long time. Um, and this is where she is so interesting. Because again, the unanimity, which we'll be getting into next, um, she is the one who has brought the unanimity to completion. Um, she has done the last bit of research. She's put the, the money in, especially recently, on this. Um, and it was her and uh, Du Shim, so the Bin Er Zongdu before Han Shu. It seems like those were the two who really, really worked on unanimity to make it happen. She seems to be in, cr in control at nearly all times. She is very paranoid, though. This, that, that is one thing that you do get from her, is that she and the Earth King are extremely paranoid characters when it comes to spies if they think they have a spy in their midst they'll sort of take advantage of them but then have them eliminated straight away no uh they don't care about the idea that they're killing anyone they're, that's just the way these two characters are and especially that scene where like she's being relatively nice to yang chen but then suddenly is just like oh i heard you were basically attacked in bin Er. I can teach you how to deal with that. And she basically starts to get really like cruel and um, uh, brutal with the descriptions to Yang Chen. And Yang Chen is really taken aback by how suddenly she shifts. Um, obviously, I think a lot of people are excited by this idea with the character that Yang Chen in the Kyoshi books is revealed to have read Guru Lahima, but also Gu uh, Guru Shoken. And in this book, we find out that she finds out about Guru Shoken through Zongdu Chai Si. She's the one who has the book and she gives it to Yang Chen. Now, I don't think we come back to that again. So we, I don't think we've got the idea that Yang Chen has read it yet. But I'm assuming going into the next book, we might address it to some degree, even if it's just a reference. But it will be interesting if maybe she there's a standout quote for Yang Chen and it affects her uh, in a bigger way. But I like the I like the reference still, um, and then I suppose speaking of that, and I suppose stuff we'll get to when we talk about unanimity. Do you guys think there's any significance to the other two books that were mentioned? Because Yang Chen looks at four books on Shai Si's shelf. One is like a Lahima kind of complete works analysis. One is the Shoken book. One is just a book about like. Uh, was it like sacred circles and how to draw them and stuff like that but then the other book is like some sort of like spiritual book about the way the different nations like meditate and chi paths or something like that um i'm wondering is that there for a reason <laughs> as we'll get into um other interesting things with her uh i found this very interesting they she talks about how 
her ancestry is like somewhat unknown, that she's from this island in the South Mose Sea. So she's basically describing that she's from an island that is not a fire island, but is kind of like in between the Earth Kingdom and the Fire Nation and that people think she's Fire Nation. But as far as she is aware, her ancestry has no benders in it. And there's no, there's not a lot of culture related to her family. So she feels like she's just like this in-between unknown character where the idea of giving someone an, a book that is like important to you is about the only thing of significance that she seems to be aware of from her family history. So I, I like this idea because it links into the idea that she wants to start this dynasty because the idea is that if she has so little history, then she wants to create a family that is noted in history. Um, so uh, that's quite interesting. And then at the end of the book, the idea is that you think Yang Chen should be able to just, in a way, take apart the whole Shang system. But she can't because of the unanimity. No one is going to believe the situation that's happening with all the Shang merchants unless the unanimity is just made public. But if it's made public, then all of a sudden the nations are going to go to war effectively over who claims ownership of this weapon. And that's how, you know, Chai Si is protecting herself because you can only get me if you put the world at risk effectively. And I like that, that I think the final message that Chai Si sends to Yang Chen is just like, you know, well played, good move. Like good move, not immediately trying to act against me. I, I, I thought that was really, really good and just a, a great setup for the next book. Um, so there's that. And that brings us into uh, unanimity here. So the, the big spoiler that um, I'm so happy that... Uh, I don't think I saw one person just like randomly openly talking about this spoiler where they didn't really need to. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that uh, a lot of people get, get their opportunity to just sort of like discover this. Because like the whole book basically leads up to the idea of what unanimity actually is. And I thought it was fantastic the way it was done. That initially it's like this thing that is shipped. It's uh, it's in three containers, and um, then you get the the reveal that uh, Yang Chen and uh, Ayunarak find these like uh, craters in the mountain that like they're testing for range. And I'm kind of like, oh, is it like a, a giant catapult or like a cannon or something like that? That seems crazy. That could fit in shipping crates. But then you get that that really crazy chapter where they get off the ship it's being unloaded and then one of the guards sabotages the crane to create a distraction and they walk off and the boxes that are the unanimity is just rocks and Kavik kind of pieces it together of like ah it's those three they're the unanimity and the second they revealed that it was three characters who are likely firebenders that's when it all came together to me because I'm like, because I'm always thinking about special bending techniques. So I'm kind of like big, tall firebenders. You just recent, you ended the chapter with explosions in the mountains, um, craters, combustion bending. And then when we finally got the sort of, you know, pop, pop, boom, it was great. Um, so let's go into this. So unanimity is three combustion benders for now. So uh, we have Thapa, Yingsu, and Zhao Yun. Um, but likely there are potentially many more to come. This is where like the whole teasing and twists and turns of the story are so interesting because you think it's about research on like a physical, like mechanical weapon. And so it's like, okay, science, the research, blueprints, stuff like that. But then because it's people, Research is still valid. They're still talking about it in that way. So it's like, okay, it's research into, I suppose, how to locate people who I guess are, have the potential for combustion bending and then how to draw the ability out of those people. That is 
extremely interesting to me. So again, a lot of the details are like much research and money has gone into the project by Dushim and now Chai C. Uh, again, a lot of the combustion bending things that I've talked about in the past in videos about special bending techniques are that all three combustion benders are tall, strongly built, but interestingly, none of the three in this book have a third eye tattoo, highlighting that I guess this is meant to be some of the earliest example of combustion bending in the entire franchise. That this is it, I guess, before it has a large history or anything like that. And I'm guessing we will move in the next book into probably the combustion benders after these three, or maybe even these three getting their third eye tattoos. Because like, like I was mentioning earlier on, those books about like the drawing sacred circles and like uh, meditating chief low. I think those Tricy reading those books is there for a reason. And it's because she's investigating, I suppose, what the ability is, how to draw it out and how to improve it. Because when you see these combustion benders in action, you, you, you notice a few details about it. They seem to struggle with energy management compared to Combustion Man and Polite. They really, really describe it that there's a lot of deep breaths before they do even one combustion blast. That, like, I, I think there's a point, like, just before they're sort of quote unquote taken out, that um, Hansha describes it as like, oh, he's doing like 20 breaths. This is going to be a big one. As if he's seen, I suppose, a blast that's sort of close to 20, so that, like, they are doing typically maybe five to 10 breaths before a normal attack. That's. We, we see Pali and Kabushi Man do it a lot quicker than that. And I think that's what highlights, you know, what the, the, the third eye tattoo is doing. It is helping the flow of chi through the forehead and the inside chakra. Because um, there's that moment where I think it's that Thapa uh, does an attack and he turns around and Hansha notes that he's like, he's like trying to like rip a hole in his forehead because, you know, in a way it, it kind of almost hurt him to fire this ability out like that, that he needs something there to uh, make it easier. Um, so that's fascinating. Um, they eat a lot, which, like, obviously, th this isn't something we particularly focus on about, like, what Pali and Kabushman's recovery is. But it, fe it seems like they can do protracted, like, multiple combustion blasts, and they're not, like dying from energy management at the end of it so it does seem like it's a major weakness with the ability as it is at the moment um, and then the big one here Thapa when asked and the only thing he says about it in terms of any level of detail Thapa mentions that many drown trying to develop this technique that I'll get I'll get to the section specifically I have it marked here um it says, uh, he asks, uh, how did you come by this power? Uh, and Thapa says, bitter work, torturous training. I didn't find this ability like a coin in the street, and neither did the others. We three are the product of significant investment. You look disappointed. Did you want me to say it was chance, a spiritual blessing? Because it was neither. I took a big gamble on myself to get to this point. Uh, I mean, a lot of us who tried to develop this technique drowned. Um, and he just says, I don't think I'll benefit from telling you anything more. So what does that mean? Now, this is where we get into the idea of like, okay, logically, how did Chai C and Dushim come across this idea? I think there's a lot of Chai C connection here. She is from an island that is maybe a fire island or near a fire island. Um, that seems to have unknown lineage. So maybe she noticed someone from her island was tall and happened to have this ability. Because I think the idea has to be that there is a combustion bender out there who just sort of had the, had this power, like came across it or, you know, some traumatic incident happened that caused them to unlock the ability which is why they know it exists in the first place to even do research into it to try and 
figure it out in the first place. So there has to be sort of like, in a way, like a, almost like, I guess, like a patient zero. There has to be that first person who they know for sure is a combustion bender. And they did research on that person and connected a few dots of like, the people most likely to be combustion benders are all tall, strongly built, maybe hail from specific isolated fire islands and have a certain lineage in some way um are firebenders uh but that the ability doesn't just like you don't just gradually unlock it even if you do a lot of firebending training it's not something that you just are going to randomly come across that something in a way has to happen to you almost to make this ability come out even if you meet all of the criteria there has to be this thing that forces it out and that's what i'm so interested by is that okay many people drowned so you obviously lean towards water so because the idea here obviously is that the the, the, the unique aspects of combustion bending are that one forehead it's one of the few bending techniques that involves something different than just general like chi manipulation it has to be specifically forehead it's like psychic fire bending so this chakra here chi flow chakra here is key you do have to be a firebender of course and breath control is important to firebending but it seems to be especially important here and um, obviously to control the technique and not just have it blow up right in front of you and actually it to project out properly. It might be some sort of a thing about maybe like, is it easier to try and do it underwater? That there's something about it where like, oh, they somehow discovered that it's very difficult to just, I suppose, make the projection thing happen through air but it can happen much easier through water. But that involves obviously them staying underwater to train a lot. Um, they, they need to explain that a little bit more if that's exactly what it is. Um, but I, I, I like that idea to, certain, to a certain degree. Otherwise, it kind of feels like is, is something related to water how they, in a way, unlock their insight chakra to even use it as a form of bending in a way um oh that that's actually a really good point there it's it's it's, it's kind of in a way simple but uh, really good um is the water training more about them learning to hold their breath for a long time um that could that, that makes sense they, they would need i suppose a a really big lung capacity i suppose to do it properly um, and maybe this is just a part of the idea of like, as we've talked about already, if you have the third eye tattoo, it seems like you don't need it to be that crazy. It doesn't need to be that extreme, but, uh, to do it in this almost forced way, you need a huge lung capacity to make it happen. But, um, yeah. And then the idea is like money, why so much money? Obviously, okay. They need to feed them. Uh, I suppose to some degree it is potentially, you know, supporting these people to develop them into the elite benders that, like, I suppose is a uh, expensive prospect. The training, firing into the mountains down in the south, uh, I guess is maybe an expensive thing to do. Um, the years of research. The interesting thing about it, though, is that the research can only be eight years or less, meaning you can't really have like generations of combustion benders because initially after my first take in the book i was kind of trying to make some sort of connection between the whole like combustion benders and the fact that chai C is pregnant i still think there might be a connection that like if she is from like a clan or her island is maybe related to the whole combustion benders thing maybe her child will be one who has the potential to be a combustion mender. And I'd be very interested, like, if, if the child is born in the next book, if she is maybe starting the the testing or the research already 
trying to see if her child maybe has the potential to be a combustion bender. That's what I'm kind of thinking in that, like, um, she herself is powerful because of her position, but she doesn't seem to be, like, um, like, uh, we don't know if she's a bender or, no, wait, she's not, a, she's not a bender. She confirms that she's not a bender. There's no bending in her family. Um, but it's not described that she's, like, a martial artist or anything like that. Um, so maybe there's a big thing that she wants her child to be the most powerful bender in the world or something like that. Um... I don't know. It, it's either this is just about her dynasty, um, her her child, or it is related to this somehow. Um, but I suppose a big question is, do you guys think there are more than just these three sort of like final products of it or or what's going on here? Because I'm, I'm, I'm assuming these three are going to come back into play. In, in the next book. And they're not just going to be held at the Air Temple for an eternity. But I think Chaisi feels like she's comfortable in the position. Because she maybe has more. That the others don't know about or something like that. And again because to explain it I think they're going to need to get into like. Third eye tattoo to make them super super effective. And um, I'm not really sure. It, it's, it's an interesting one. I'm so excited to see how this plays into it and all that sort of stuff um so there's that um guru patik could help them unlock their chakras um we are very much before guru patik here and um, yeah she wouldn't give all of her cards to hansha if she didn't have more being produced yeah because she seems to be somewhat okay with the fact that he got these three and that this, I suppose, was a test of like, okay, they held off the Earth King's forces, but they're at risk because if you use them and just everyone gangs up on them like that. There's, that that's the big thing you get from, I suppose, the action scene at the end is that these three positioned in towers hold off an entire city because of the threat of their power. But the organization that has to go into place of like the amount of food that has to be delivered to them and... Um, the, the amount of time that they have to be aware of every possible strategy strategy against them uh, that someone could just sneak up and do something to them which is exactly how they're ultimately taken out that because it is just basically three people and then Han Shu, like basically like bringing food to them it, it just you, you see the the in a way error the, the weakness of this but if you had like 20 combustion benders, that's suddenly a large enough number where you have so much power at your disposal, disposal that like, I don't know what you're going to be able to do there. Because in a way, this works because it's like a manageable amount. But if there is a lot, this is a, a major kind of a problem here. Uh, how many there are is a very interesting thing. So, again, what what, what does Thapas say? Uh, da, da, da. A lot of us who tried to develop this technique drowned. So, that's a big one there. Um, and, <sighs> whatever clan breeds combustion vendors. Like, uh, I think it's probably close-ish to that. Uh, I think her clan is probably maybe important to the process in some way. Uh, but I think it's more that like she and Du Shim are maybe utilizing her clan and like nearby islands to, to make this happen. But like it's it's definitely going to be, I think, something like that. We'll see how much the idea is like the are they full on into the idea of like, you know, breeding people for their abilities or what um but uh th that that's a big thing um as for like will will they introduce many more i can see them having maybe one more like completed combustion bender and maybe like alluding to the fact that like chaisi's child is going to be a combustion bender or something like that um but i do think they're probably going to keep it to the idea that these three are here which brings up the idea of um, these three 
are going to be involved. But how do they get out? Because it seems like what they've done here is that like they have like multiple very powerful airbenders guarding them. And it feels like there's going to be enough airbenders to where like they can contain them if needed. So in a normal situation, I don't think these three will able be able to just fight their way out of the temples um, and it just go that that easily for them. The thing I initially was thinking was like, what if Sozin's Comet comes in the next book? That would be a way to be like, whoa, what's a combustion bender like uh, during a comet? And um, that's a that that's an interesting question. What is a combustion bender like during the comet? Because that would suddenly make them more powerful, it would likely increase their control. That would put them well above how many air, airbenders they have going up against them. The problem is obviously, okay, is that actually going to work? I actually did the research down here. So the comets. Um, you obviously have the ATLA finale one when Aang is 112. The first Sozin's comet is obviously when Aang is 12. Then you go back, you obviously skip through Roku, because he only lives to be 70. So Kyoshi experiences three comets. One when she's 212, one when she's 112, and one has happened in the years just before the Kyoshi novels when she's 12. And then the next one, I suppose, would be the one that could come into play during Yang Chen's life, which is you go back 100 years from this, meaning you go through, okay, 12 years of Kyoshi's life, 33 years of Karuk's life, and then a further 55. So 55 years before Karuk is born, one happens. So one happens during Yang Chen's life. But for it to happen in like the next book, in the next couple of months in the book, that means it has to happen when Yang Chen is 18, um, which will create a situation where maybe Yang, Yang Chen is theoretically 72 or 73 uh, for it to happen up next. Um, I'm not sure. It seems extreme, but it is a way for them to get out. Um, given that the book is about an extremely powerful bending discipline, I can't imagine that they'd do the like double superpower thing on it to just make it like super insane. But it was just an interesting kind of thing I wanted to go through about like how reasonable it actually is. My interpretation of this is that likely Yang Chen probably lives to be a bit older than this meaning that it probably happens likely like 10, 20, 30 years after the events of this book rather than right now. But, you know, I don't think it's crazy to assume the comet might come into play. Uh, don't forget it exists, I suppose, is the main thing. So, um, yeah, that's, that's unanimity. Um, very cool. What it means is that I think the next book will probably explain to us more technicalities of how combustion bending works. And I, I'm the, the big thing I'm interested in is like what Thoppa says there is that at least with this ability, it's not something that you just wake up and can do. That it doesn't seem like this is the same as say the Yukon family and their you know, psychic blood bending. Sure, they have to do their training to get to the point where they can use the, the potential that they have. But it still, it seems like fundamentally there's nothing that holds them back outside of just doing normal training from getting to that level. Um, lava bending is a weird one in that like Bo Lin obviously had to be put in a pretty crazy situation to unlock his. And is that what they're going for here? I'm, I'm wondering, is, is it going to be maybe as simple as that? That they just highlight for these extreme skills that you have to be in a life-death situation to unlock the special skill that you actually do have the potential to do. Will it be something along those lines? Um, that would be, uh, I think, a very interesting thing. Otherwise... They're maybe creating some sort of a deeper thing about it where like, okay, combustion bending, is this more like manufactured or forced ability in some way? Maybe there is a, a more spiritual way to like unlock it without needing to risk yourself drowning. 
and I'm interested to see how they go about explaining that and in what way it works. Um, so there's that. Um, then we go into uh, Jujenta, uh, who... In, in the early scenes, I don't think you read into him too much. But I, I think he seems very, very interesting reflecting on it again. So... What you learn here is that he killed his brother in the past. He has these deep regrets about it. Uh, he doesn't have a top knot, despite being a fire national. So he has this uh, dishonor on him. That is, it seems like it's a combination of both fire nation, but also the Yuyan clan thing as well. So it's this almost like double dishonor. Because of this, he also doesn't use a bow. It's obviously he views this as like he he broke the sacred art the, the you know he used his skill in violence so he like broke the the idea of how their skill works or whatever and he doesn't use a bow anymore until he is called to to use his skills at their maximum at the end he is spiritual he prays to the spirits uh, about what happens um, and obviously greatly respects the avatar because that's what obviously like uh you know gets him back on track yang chen obviously uh, whatever she says to him is a life-changing event for him. Um, and then, yeah, the Yu Yan thing. He mentions a Yu Yan doesn't miss, and he shows us a couple of extreme acts of like precision, using knives, but also using the bow. Um, and that's very, very interesting. Now, what is cool about this is that this relates more to the Yu Yan stuff from the RPG game than it does the Yu Yan stuff from uh, the show. This is more about the Yu Yan sort of clan or family than it is about the Yu Yan uh, military organization and um, because obviously the Uzuku Yu Yan ends up being uh, Uzuku Yu Yan seems to be the character who gives the skills over to the Fire Nation military or is like forced to do it in some way. Uh, in that with her, it's described that her skills are spiritual in nature. So there, there is also a sense that their crazy accuracy comes from a sort of spiritual source as well. Now, they obviously go on when they're a military organization to have the... Um, the, the wing kind of tattoo, the symbol over their eyes, uh, and then they have the, the little uh, arrow. It seems to just be a symbol of the clan at this point. So we don't really know if there's any sort of like chi related stuff with the clan and how exactly their skill works. Um, they are teasing though, um, which is quite interesting. They are very much teasing the idea that I think we are going to learn about what happened to Jujinta's brother in a bit more detail. Because it almost comes across as if maybe like an accident happened. Because there's the scene where he um, says a Yu Yan doesn't miss. And Kavik's like, and he said it with like a lot of regret in his in his heart. So either it's because he was like banished from the Yu Yan clan. Or he in a way regrets the idea that like, yeah, it's true. We don't miss in a way like we can't miss as a Yu Yan. And it's almost this idea that, like, did he, like, fire his bow in some crazy way, thinking he wouldn't hit his brother, but it did hit his brother. And it's just this sort of proof that the skill is spiritual in nature or or what. I'm not really sure. But I liked his inclusion as, like, a more spiritual character. Um, so th that was quite interesting. Um, let's see, Jin's gonna be really cool. I need to reread the chapter explaining what happened with the bison whistle. Okay, so, uh, the idea with this is that, um, Kavik, to try and get in touch with Yang Chen, given that he was being watched and Yang Chen is likely being watched, but no one, no one will have a problem with Kavik speaking to Jujinta, but Kavik and Yang Chen can't interact. So he gives the bison whistle, which Yang Chen gave to him, to Jujinta, and basically says, okay, when you are doing your spiritual thing next time, blow on this whistle, it'll 
something spiritual will happen to you. And the idea is that Yang Chen comes to... Uh, oh, I'm saying Yu Yan. <laughs> he comes to Jiu Jinta um, and he relays the information about you need to come back to Bin Er. So it's just that Jiu Jinta is used as like an intermediary between Kavik and Yang Chen, given that the two can't interact because of the what's going on here. Um, it's a weird one because like they explain it sort of like after the fact when there's a lot of other stuff going on. Um, but it is there in the book that uh, that's what happens. Because um, obviously Jiu Jinta arrives at Kavik's door with the bison whistle on and is like, a changed man and, and Kavik's kind of like whoa like you're surprisingly confident and he's like he's just kind of like oh <laughs> uh, at the door and because obviously he met Yang Chen and I guess to him Yang Chen is a spiritual someone spiritual who could offer him some level of forgiveness enough that he will participate in this and use a bow so we'll see what happens like I said, I, I think he'll show up again, but I think it will be more in a like sort of Kirima Wong way, like in the second book, where they're only there for like a little bit, but it will be just enough to get some like uh, key little points. But I actually would like a, a, a somewhat detailed backstory about like, is it a Yu Yan clan? Is it just a family and that is a name? Like, is his name Jujinta Yu Yan or um, what's the deal here? Um, and then, yeah, that's an interesting question. Will Jujinta become a companion? I don't think Yang Chen will, like, have him around with her without Kavik. Uh, but I can see at some point, like, he's involved in, like, the final battle or something like that. So that, that's, that's somewhat interesting. Um, so, yeah, Jujinta was, was quite fun in the end. Much more fun than, like, say, like a lot of the other characters who were introduced in that section of the book, like Tail, um, like, yeah, that Pung guy and so on. So, so some of the other members of the John Dury organization were not the most interesting characters, but um, Jujinta, I thought, was quite cool. The, the, the knife-throwing bit at the start and the guy he's going up against does the crazy move. Um, but then instead of doing that, he just stabs the guy, so you're like, oh, he can't throw the knife as good. But then he does the same thing in a really stressful situation. And it's like, mine was better. You know why. Um, so that was quite good. Uh, the clans of the Fire Nation were named after mostly flowers, right? Um, I, I believe so. Um, we'll see exactly what's going on there. Hmm. But yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's spiritual-based ability. I, I'd like it to be fleshed out a bit more. Uh, and what's going on. Because um, Yang Chen seems to recognize the uh, Yu Yan symbol of the bird spreading its wings. Um, so she obviously finds that interesting to a certain degree. Um, then, uh, Taegum and Akudan. Um, in the grand scheme of the book, they are not used a massive amount. But I thought they played their role pretty well. Um I, I really like the history aspect of this, that these are characters who were actually, without being like major players, ended up right in the middle of the Platinum Affair. That like, these were two of the guys delivering the Platinum um, to General Nong. And, you know, they basically got taken out as well in the like ambush at Lamopaka's Crossing and got captured. Um... I, I thought that, that bit of connection was actually very cool to just highlight that these are experienced water tribe men and the reason that they are so loyal to the Avatar is that in the middle of this like crazy political situation, she made sure to get out basically diplomats who were not really involved in, in, in the situation that much. So uh, that was an, a nice explanation. Um, of course, we find out that they're married. It uh, introduces us to the concept of like, okay, even with, I guess, same-sex relationships, there's still that element of like a betrothal necklace, or in this case, betrothal armbands. Um, they don't... 
but maybe someone else can, can mention this. They don't say which tribe Tyagum is from. Akudan, they definitely say he's southern, but they don't say where Tyagum is from. He mentions he's from the Orca Islands, but I don't believe we know where the Orca Islands are. So my assumption is just that Tyagum probably has to be from the north, which is why betrothal necklaces are used in the first place, because they're a northern thing. Also, because they were basically working for the northern chief, I assume one of them would also have to be northern for that reason as well. Um, so, you know, interesting. But I like the idea. Like the, the, the Avatar had um, uh, connections here in John Dury. Um, they run an inn there. And at this point in the book, I, I did like that little explanation of that. Even in the Fire Nation, Shang City they still get water tribe stuff, even though it's far away from either tribe. Um, so that's a little bit of an interesting kind of dynamic as well. Um, that these Shang cities are sort of proto-Republic cities in a way, because they have, they, they have like Earth Kingdom people there, but they also have like people from the nation that the Shang city is about as well and others. But what's interesting is that, like, we know something happens to get rid of the Shang cities, like, they go away, and things get, like, worse before they get better with regards to, like, Republic City. So, I, I like this as this sort of, like, proto thing of, like, this, it almost comes together here, that if the world leaders worked properly, these Shang cities could have been Republic cities all around the world before it actually happened. And um, sure, they're a little bit focused on just the, the trade, I suppose, but it's still, like, interesting overall. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 these two are, 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 are fun. Like, they're, they're involved in the action at the end, uh, doing a lot of the heavy lit lifting, literally. Um, in that, like, Akudan is described as being, like, massive. I think they even say he's bigger than any of the the combustion benders. So um, I'm guessing it's just a situation where the combustion benders are notably tall, but not like giants like Combustion Man and Police seem to be. Whereas Akudan is actually like kind of, I suppose, Combustion Man size, I suppose, is, is the idea, um, which is kind of fun. He's missing an arm. Um, there was that weird section of that chapter where, like, Kavik started guessing stuff about them, and there was a lot of information thrown out that the characters basically said, eh, no. Like, the whole thing about, like, uh, a, a branch part of the Northern family, and, like, someone, like, what, what, like was born with one arm or something like that, and it's like, what are you talking about here? It was interesting, but when you're giving information about these characters and you don't actually say some key things, it was a bit like, oh, okay. Okay. But still, um, nice to get them here. We'll probably see them a little bit in the next book as well. Um, I don't know. Uh, may could the, could either of these two be maybe what, uh, well, wait, Akudan is not a bender, I don't believe. So Taigum is a bender. Could he have, somehow been a water bending teacher i'm not really sure um so hmm i don't know I'm, I'm just trying to think of like would these two you could definitely say are considered avatar companions maybe they died to protect her i, I don't know we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait and see um i shouldn't be speculating that every character close to yang chen will die but it's 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 worth the the mention um Okay, then we get uh, a very notable character here. Earth King Faishan. Um, definitely one of the most interesting characters just because of the, the legend that is presented about this guy. And what is so interesting is that you meet him right at the end of the book uh, and Yang Chen has a fairly normal meeting with him where he just gets a little bit ominous right at the end. But you find out that he's 28 years old and she describes him as not being, like, a particularly, like, intimidating character. And that, like, 
he 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 attends this meeting here in the middle ring in secret with her dressed up as just like a normal person like he he doesn't want the ceremony here he doesn't want people spying on him so he is intelligent but it highlights that he was only 20 when he was the central figure in this world defining event the platinum affair um that's kind of crazy like this surprising act of like military prowess where like he figured out what his uh, political enemies were doing and made the perfect move that won the day gave him the advantage and effectively gave him this legendary reputation with people of like he gets stuff done and you don't go against the earth king or he will bring his army down upon you and is known for being brutal like there's that part like somewhat early on in the book where I think Q g- tells is it Q? I think he tells like uh Kavik that like oh the 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 Earth King has done his latest round of like throwing bodies up on top of the walls because he thinks a bunch of people are spies in his uh court. That's pretty crazy that he does that so kind of publicly. Uh, and so yeah, you see like yeah, he he's paranoid and um, these clear outs of those who act against him. In the scene with Yang Chen, you find that, that he's actually somewhat reasonable. And he seems to sort of care about Ba Sing Se and the Earth Kingdom, uh, including, like, the lower ring. Now, she does say that's maybe some sense of, like, in this era where the nations are really sort of, like, at each other. He sort of wants to... He doesn't want the lower ring to be looked at politically as, like, an example of look how you treat your people. So he even he is trying with the, the lower ring to improve it, uh, even if just to look better. Um, and the big thing here, this is the big threat. This is, the, this is one of the cliffhangers of the book, is just Yang Chen is hiding what happened in Bin Er, hiding the combustion benders from him. Because I suppose it, it publicly hasn't got out, apart from a handful of people, that combustion benders, like people with bending abilities, were what caused what happened in Bin Ur. Otherwise, it is thought to be spirits causing all this uh, lights and sounds. And she's hoping that this is what will keep everyone off the scent. But he is aware of that. He, he roughly believes what Yang Chen says, but does say he will continue his investigation. And leaves her with a kind of ominous threat of like, if I find, find out that what happened in Bin Ur was actually like people with abilities doing that. Like, like you would, you don't want to know what I'm going to do to the, the nations and the earth kingdom will be hurt just as much as anything else. So like really like crazy statement at the end of this book that he is going to cause so much damage. He doesn't even care if his own nation gets hurt. That's how like upset he is about this idea. And then, especially like like bringing the the other world leaders into play here the fact that like Kavik is nearly assassinated by thin claws at the end of the book or is like captured i guess he was going to be captured um purely because he might have information on unanimity really highlights that we're going to be in a pretty crazy situation in the next book about anyone who has information on this is going to be targeted and the fact that like Yang Chen just has the three combustion benders and Hansha like held in the Northern Air Temple. I, I, I love how they present the, you know, how delicate of a situation we are in. That if any of like these three characters, Fei Xian, Oya Luk, Gan Ryu, if they find out about the existence of combustion benders, like a war is basically going to break out. And I don't think it's going to be stopped very easily at all. And then, like, Chai Si is involved in this um, quite heavily in some way. Um, there's uh, still the Zongdu of uh, Port Tugak, uh, Ashuna, who's out there. There's still the stuff with Taku that I guess we have to cover at some point um, as well. And then Kalyan is still out there. Now, the way they present Kalyan at the end is that he's almost like running for his life because uh, I suppose he's more or less basically outed so we don't know where he's going to turn up or how he'll gain power or anything like that. Um, I don't know. I have a feeling Kalyan will be used in a pretty big way in the next book so I wouldn't be surprised if they do something like 
he turns up in Taku and is uh, like taking the position as like Zongdu of Taku or something like that, um, just to to create like a big position for him as a character. I think something somewhat notable like that is actually going to happen. Um, so yeah, like the the political situation around basically just the existence of combustion benders is fascinating to me to see how they actually go about doing it uh, in the next book um but uh yeah interesting um let's see what else is there to discuss i have just this Susan's comet and that is mostly it so, uh, I suppose, uh, are there any other parts of the book that I might have forgotten to do, like, notes on here that you guys want me to talk about? Or any, like, opinions you guys have you want me to, to cover? Um, because other than that, I think I've, I've covered, I think, most everything I want to talk about. I don't think I've forgotten any key characters or anything like that. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, there's one Order of the White Lotus thing I want to talk about. Um Okay, uh, probably one of my final points is just um, in the scene with, uh, with Ayunarak, when she mentions that she knows about Yang Chen's gift, Yang Chen connects a few dots and realizes there must have been an Order of the White Lotus member in the Western Air Temple. And she is speculating about who it is. And she thinks it might be, what if it's the ab abbess? What if it's uh, Sering, who we see a couple of times? What if it, were, if it was Jetson? Like, she's actually thinking that it might be Jetson. And maybe it is. That's what's kind of so interesting in all of this. Um, that that seems to be the case. Because she knows to, like, protect Yang's head, Yang Chen's head and, and all these little things. That was, I thought, a very nice little subtle point. That that reveal, I guess, is going to have to maybe come out. And... What if it is Jetson? That would... It would slightly... I don't know. I suppose it would actually greatly uh, affect Yang Chen. Because suddenly the person she looked up to the most was giving information, like key information about her to someone else. And it probably isn't going to be Jetson, but I wonder who it will be, I suppose, is, is probably the main thing. Um, so there's that. Um, but I, I, I think for now, that is most of everything I think we can say about that topic. Um, so let's see. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Wartime avatars. That was a little bit like, I, I think I even had to do a comment on my video because I, I think I glanced past that one. It's, it's just a really small section of a chapter where it's just sort of mentioned that I think Kavik is aware that in history people know that there are at least a few avatars that are known to have like died in battle in major conflicts and that they are thought of as these like wartime champions who like went out in a blaze of glory in the middle of uh, battles and um, so that's very interesting because like obviously like all the avatars that we know of I suppose really like Wan is the only one you can really say kind of went out in the middle of like a battle but we don't really know the full situation surrounding his death but like it seems like he's the only one who we know of, like full-on like died in the middle of a major conflict otherwise like it seems like most of them died in a normal way or we don't know how they died so just a, a little thing in terms of like we're looking for all the past avatar information that was at least something of note um and and those are interesting situations because um those are the avatars who would have to be like the most careful about using the avatar state knowing that they're out on the battlefield and they're expected to be amazing but to be amazing they have to put themselves at risk so um interesting stuff um i suppose speaking of which uh, yang chen using the avatar state she uses it once in this book and that is to clear the snow off the, the mountain where the uh, test firing has been done of the weapons, so the combustion menders. Um, 
other than that, I think she just mentions that, like, after the old iron incident, she can use it better now. So, there was that. Um, so there's that. I wish they mentioned Zito more. Yes. Um, I, I liked... I, there was a slight plot of this book of her kind of having scenes early on in the book where Zito would get brought up and she'd sort of roll her eyes and kind of move past it. But I like that she sort of, over the course of the book, moved to utilizing Zito more and more. That she has that moment with the uh, the Sawan clan leader, uh, like I suppose his, his what, cousin, uh, where he says, where, where she says, like, oh, Yang Chen explains it herself and it's like very logical of like the few, the next generation will be fine but he's still really annoyed and mad but then she says the Zito quote and he calms down and he's it was like uh, you lost the was it lost the melon but you have the sesame uh, as an example of like it will come back eventually in time but then at the end of the book she full on utilizes Zito to her advantage and is like, oh, yeah, uh, Zito will be fully implementing the new way the Shang City should work. I, I, I spoke to him. He, he knows exactly how to do it. He's a legendary uh, organizer. He, he, I, will, I won't be involved much. It'll all be Zito. So she's utilizing the fact that basically no one apart from the Avatar knows exactly how the communication works. And so she's just like, yeah he'll do it um i still would like to see her have a conversation with him and i think that is something that probably needs to happen but it was again sort of like the general past life thing it was a little bit more of a subtle plot than the way you maybe expected it to be um but yeah i think that's pretty much everything i want to talk about here um is there anything? <laughs> Hoping something will... Uh... Oh, yeah. Q, actually, I want to talk about. Uh, I, the pronunciation of his name is so weird. Q-I-U. It's like Chio or something like that is how the the uh, audiobook pronounces it. Kavik's like information broker, the guy who is killed along with Sadao. I, I thought that was a quite shocking like moment in the book of like Kavik just being brought out for his first job and it's body disposal and his friend is right there and especially like when we went to it sort of later on and like you that was a big emotional moment where like the plan was forming and then it goes first part of it goes wrong and yang chen and kavik are both sort of very frustrated they're they feel like lost because of what happened like people have died effectively because of their scheming and it eventually results in this kind of pretty nice emotional moment of like Havoc being in a way surprised at how emotional he is about the death of this person he considers a friend, but doesn't consider to be too close. But Yang Chen kind of realizing that like, this is what it is to be an Avatar companion. You care about him because he deserved better than to die like that. And that's what it is to be an Avatar companion. You'll have to care about so many people including people you'll never even meet but if it helps you because of sort of the way my ability works because i'm the avatar because i saw him with you somehow he'll always be remembered in history because he was involved somewhere along the line with an avatar that was a nice sort of kind of poignant moment i i, I thought that was quite uh subtle um and just his death was just the moment where like oh there's that sort of in a way kiyoshi brutality the the tone of the kiyoshi books kind of coming out for like the first time that some of the shangs are pretty ruthless with how they take people out um but uh yeah 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 with, with the zito thing you got i suppose just how incredible of a like diplomat he is how respected zito is in these regards that they immediately are like he said that <laughs> like um it's 
especially the Earth King at the end. It was kind of crazy how it's just he switches the second he says that. It's just like, you're not going to be involved, but, but Zito, my man, he, he's going to get it done. Um, so I, I, I'd like to learn more about him, definitely, in, in terms of like, was he just known for that? Did he ever have any sort of more like combat based things that he had to do or, or what? But still quite good. So, um, yeah, uh, like I said, uh, that's most everything. Uh, so kind of, again, final call for topics or kind of points from the book you want to uh, talk about here. Um, while that's happening, I suppose, uh, not sure when I'm going to do the next stream. Uh, like I said last time, uh, my rough thing that I'm planning to do is roughly like one stream a month. Um, so, you know, we'll probably try and do one next month. Um, not sure what the topic will be on. Again, it will depend on what's going on and so on. Because, um, you know, I have a few things that I want to do. Like, I have 10 more chapter analysis videos to do for this book. Um, and then... There's probably at least probably two, maybe three sort of uh, solo topic videos that I want to cover from this book. One of them, of course, is the combustion benders. Uh, the problem with that is that I'm struggling about how I want to, like, in a way, title that one. Because I know some people take a while to get to the novels. And I don't want to just, like, have in the title of a video, like more combustion benders and make it like super clear that that is like the new the key dynamic of the new book within the first few weeks of like the book being out so i'm kind of thinking like how exactly i'm going to do that one i might just like do it like a general like combustion bending discussion topic and not really allude in like the title or thumbnail to to the new benders or the book but then at the start of the video just say that there's like spoilers for everything and eventually lead into it and um, i don't know we'll, we'll, we'll see if i want to do that one like soonish or kind of wait a few weeks but it is probably the main one i really want to get into um but we'll see but anyway because of uh past slash future visions lots of spiritual locations somewhat in the middle of portals um because of past slash future visions lots of spirituality located somewhat in the middle of portals uh, I'm not sure what that comment is about. Oh, oh, sorry. It's continued on for the first one. Completely different topic. Could the tree of time be connected to the swamp tree? That It's an interesting one, definitely. And th that topic of like, basically, is the banyan tree, banyan grove tree in the swamp, is that the sort of like physical version of the tree of time? Um... <laughs> It's hard to say because, of course, it, the way it comes across is that, like, the Tree of Time is, like, the center of the spirit world. And I suppose, technically, you could say that on a typical way that you look at the map, the Banyan Grove Tree is more or less in the center of the the map. But because, obviously, it's a sphere, it it is just, like, a place on it. So, um... I see the connection, but, uh, and, and like it fits, of course, because they're like notable trees and stuff like that. Um, but I think they would have made that maybe a little bit clearer just because there is that idea that like you go to the North and South pole portals and where they directly come out is like right next to the tree of time. So you, you basically go the furthest away in the physical world from the banyan tree that you can pretty much be, but you come out next to its equivalent in the spirit world, right next to it. But again, again, space and time, does it mean anything when you go between worlds? I'm not really sure, but anyway, <laughs> there's that. Um, okay, question here. Do you think Zito will appear in the second novel? I'd love for the opening of book two for Yan Chen to be panicky explaining her deal with the Earth King to him while he just stares. Um... I, th I think we will get some sort of a scene with Zito after everything that has, you know, happened in that book, everything gets resolved. I think we'll probably have some sort of a thing where 
Yang Chen will get her moment like, say, Kyoshi got when she spoke to Yang Chen of just him in a way alerting her to the fact that, look, I'm hugely respected, but here's what I did wrong. And you don't think I did this wrong, but in my mind, this was my problem. And everyone like ignores it because I was so amazing at, at this. And that's just the way you have to accept it in a way. In a way, I suppose to Yang Chen, the point more needs to be made that like you can never be the perfect avatar. No matter what you do, you can never be the perfect avatar. I think that's probably something that they might go for with him. Uh, because he seems to be quote unquote presented as one of the more like flawless avatars so far um it's like obviously there it's implied that she is potentially likely has talked to him already that's where it does feel like the book sort of holds back on this in a way that if she has this specific issue with her relationship um with i suppose the reputation of her versus her predecessor you'd think she would bring up more specifically how her conversations with Zito have went. I think they'll do something. It's hard to speculate exactly like how this will be done, but that they will do it. Um, let's see. Uh, didn't they say Zito was a good spy? Um, I, I'd have to find out where this part is in the book. But yeah, they, they say something along these lines of like, um, Yang Chen is just like likely every avatar in history eventually by the end of their life became like a master of like manipulation to some degree and then they make some sort of a comment about Zito I forget where it is but it, it's the one where I, I know in my video I made a mistake because I I, uh, I didn't realize the context of what was being said there that the word August Zito like meant like you know the August as like a descriptor rather than it being I thought it was just like a typo it was meant to be avatar I forget where exactly that one is um so based on the book that must have been in or around her conversation with the Shang merchants uh let me see where if I can find this one um Hmm. Uh, is it the previous chapter? Um, hmm. Yeah, I I have to find that. Uh, it it might take me a, a little bit. I'll I'll go on as we continue. Um, I want to see the foggy swamp tribe formed. Um, Foggy Swamp is already around in Yang Chen, so you'd have to go back much further. Because uh, Sadao is described as being uh, from Nanyan, which is close to like Foggy Swamp. So it's obviously a, the the third water tribe has already been there for quite a while. Um, I feel like as opposed to Kyoshi or Korra, Yang Chen is trying not to be her, her predecessor, hence her lack of conversation with them. Um, yeah, like like th that is an interesting point that because because Yang Chen is so connected with her past lives, she almost is like almost ignoring them. Now she's not ignoring them because she has actually tried to to talk to them, but maybe her perspective on it is a little skewed because she has like experienced these memories like against her will effectively. And there's that line. Um, I, I let, let me let me try and find this line. Actually, I, I think I know more clearly where this one is. Um, that she says to uh, Mama Ayunarak. Uh, where is it? No, not that one. Not that one. Um. She says, I have felt the shame of avatars gone by. Uh, 
lived through failures not recorded in history. And I can tell you with absolute certainty, not a single one of my past lives that I've connected with wishes they'd waited longer to solve a problem. So it, it's it's very like intense there of like, it's true. She has probably directly in a way like experienced the failures of dozens of avatars. She knows exactly what like an avatar who has made a mistake what it is what what it feels like more heavily than anyone else she is like directly felt it and because of that she's really really forging her own path and not relying on the um just on the wisdom of the past and stuff like that um let's see quick speculation uh, what which avatar book five would focus on okay Recent interviews with FC Yi, he has basically alluded to the fact that he seems like he would only feel comfortable writing about the avatars we know at least a little bit about, which seems to be uh, Kyoshi, uh, Yangshen, Kurok, um, and Roku. Now, it feels like Ro- uh, sorry, Kurok's story is mostly told. Uh, I had a quick look at, you know, people have posted pictures of the uh deleted scene from the the yang chan exclusive edition which is from shadow of kyoshi which seems to suggest that like oh they were planning to include like the umi stuff as just like a a quick little addition rather than like a full story so it feels like there's maybe not a ton of room maybe to do a karuk book or if there is they might want to create more of a a gap between it and uh shadow of kyoshi um I, I think there's room to create sort of a, a like teenage adventure for Karuk and his team. That would be really nice. But probably Karuk, sorry, sorry, probably Roku next. I think you have to use some of the world building from the Legends RPG that we just got. And <laughs> Roku, who went from being initially the past avatar we knew the most about is probably now the one in a way we know like the least about on a general level outside of just the uh, relationship with Sozin type dynamic. I, th- I think Roku is probably what they have to do. Um, I think, you know, we've had, you know, two female avatars in a row. I'd like to see a male avatar get tackled. And Roku, I think, seems like a really cool idea. Now, there might be a slight problem just with regards to like the uniqueness there because of course um with yang chen you have like a fully realized avatar with a little bit of uniqueness because because she found out she was the avatar so early she's managed to complete her training in full at like 17 whereas roku if we're getting a story with him at 17 he is like what a year into his training so he's probably at the air temple give or take or uh, something like that so that could be somewhat interesting like to just have like a an adventure with an avatar you know right in the middle of the normal training when something happens um otherwise i think you might just have to accept that you need to write about the character when they're a little bit older you probably have to age up like for, for, for a YA book, you probably will have to do it maybe more in his twenties, right towards the end of his training. Um, that, or yeah, yeah. Let's not forget Juan. Uh, yeah. I don't think directly alluded to Juan, but he is an avatar we know about and his, the core of his story is told, but there is, I think there's a lot he could do in the the gap that they really quickly brush over at the end of beginnings part two i think that could be great in terms of further fleshing out of that era especially post you know one being the avatar seeing what happens addressing the really early nations that could be very very good and based on stuff he has said he might feel a little bit intimidated by potentially having to develop so much like early world building himself um so that might slightly hinder you know him wanting to to tackle something so very different than all that we've had up to now 
which is why I do feel that he, he he it seems like he feels comfortable tackling this you know like hundred to three hundred year era right before Ang, um, but we'll, we'll we'll see what happens. Um, given where the new Roku info came from, feels like Avatar Studios is going to tackle it, but we'll see. Perhaps. Um, hmm. I feel like Roku is eluded, but I want to see Zito. And, and then that, and then that's the thing of like, he has basically introduced Zito, but we did see Zito technically in the show. So there is some potential for them to do a book about him, especially after this. Um, but again, it would have to be YA. So I wonder like teenage Zito, like what would they do? Um, cause that would be a contrast. Cause I think everyone would expect that book to be the politic book where it is just diplomacy accounting. So it would, it would maybe be a nice switch up if they just randomly decided that like, Hey, little known is that like early on in, in, in Zito's career, he actually like had to deal with a lot of more physical threats. So th- th- there's, there's room to work with of like, um, covering what happened there. And then with him, you can address like who the avatar before was was it Salai and and all these sort of stuff um so th- th- there's there's things like that that I think are are pretty interesting um let me see if I can find that one quote here um Nah, uh, I can't find that Zito quote at the moment. Uh, I know I'm probably close to it, but uh, I don't want to just spend a mili- multiple minutes silent here trying to find it. But um, yeah, uh, I think that's about it for the stream. Uh, I-, I think we we went through it a lot. Um, obviously, like there's always time in streams coming up where if something else comes up, some interesting discussion topics on this uh, stuff comes up, we'll get to it. Um probably starting uh next weekend me and greg on the podcast will get to starting the uh reviews so uh if you're not familiar with the way we did them it's we'll do the first third of the book probably next weekend followed by the middle third of the book and then the the final third of the book so there'll be another chance for us to to have some uh, more in-depth uh discussion on it and like i said the chapter analysis videos i should be wrapping up in the next week just over a week and then getting into some other discussions uh on the book but uh yeah uh unless there are some very very final last minute topics uh i think that maybe wraps us up for this stream um so um i guess uh thanks to everyone for uh joining me once again um but uh yeah i guess i'll see you guys on the next one which should be hopefully at some point uh next month but uh yeah that's been it thanks for watching everyone and bye